Uh, good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, if you wish to use tablets or mobile phones during the meeting, please switch to the flight mode as they may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. That is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, we have received apologies today from Claire Adamson. Uh, I welcome Stuart Stevenson to the meeting as uh, Claire's substitute for this morning. Welcome, Stuart. Um, and we'll turn uh, to agenda item one, which is the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. Uh, it's day three uh, of our consideration uh, of stage two. Uh, I welcome back Marco Biaggi, Minister for Local Government and Community Empowerment. I also welcome Alison Johnston and Ken McIntosh. Uh, later in the proceedings, we will also be joined by Alison McInnes. Uh, everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the latest marshalled list of amendments and the groupings of amendments which sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. Uh, there will be one debate on each group of amendments. Uh, I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in each group to speak to and move their amendment and to speak to all of the other amendments in the group. Uh, members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate by that by catching my attention in the usual way. Uh, if he has not already spoken in the group, I will invite the minister to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. The debate on each group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press their amendment to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the committee must immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment, when I call it, they should say, not moved. Please remember that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members or their official substitutes are allowed to vote at stage two. Voting in any division is by show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. Uh, the committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, and so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. And if we can start off, uh, can I call Amendment 1084 in the name of the Minister and a group on its own? Minister, uh, could you speak to and move your amendment, please? Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Amendment 1084 responds to the recommendation made by the Committee to review the legislation relating to Forestry Commission Scotland leasing land to communities for forestry purposes. This was supported by a number of stakeholders, not least the Scottish Woodlot Association. <clears throat> Excuse me. The existing legislation allows FCS to delegate its forest management functions, uh, allowing FCS to delegate its forest management functions, is based on the requirements of the community right to buy provisions under part two of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. It requires a community body to be a company limited by guarantee and to define its community by postcode units. Since the requirement of the community right to buy scheme are being amended by the bill, together with the introduction of asset transfer requests for community bodies, it is right to amend the forestry legislation to align with those new schemes. The amendment will allow for any form of corporate body to take on a forestry lease, and the community represented by that body need not be defined by geographical boundaries. It also brings the requirements for a community body in line with the criteria for a community-controlled body, which can make an asset transfer request. I should make clear these criteria apply only to leases for forestry purposes, which are typically for 25 years or more. FCS also leases and sells land to community organisations for other purposes, such as recreation or housing, through the National Forest Land Scheme. All these transactions will in future come under the rules for asset transfer requests, as set out in the bill, but relevant authorities are free to set their own policies for leases, depending on the length and type of agreement. It just so happens that for FCS, that policy has to be set out in legislation, and that is what this amendment seeks to do. I move Amendment 1084. Thank you, Minister. Does anybody else wish to enter the debate? 
Um, no, in which case the question is that Amendment 1084 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 1231 in the name of Alison Johnston, uh, grouped with the other amendments shown on the groupings. Uh, Ms Johnston, could I ask you to move Amendment 1231 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for their time today and the convener for agreeing that this important issue should be considered at stage two. I know, I know you've got a lot of amendments to cover, so I'll keep this summary brief. I'll explain the purpose and rationale first and then quickly summarise the practical operation of these amendments. The problem I'm asking Parliament to fix is straightforward and should be obvious to everyone. Football has been dragged from the back pages of Scotland's newspapers to the front by a series of catastrophic failures from small clubs like Gretna to clubs at the very top like Hearts and Rangers. The current model of ownership has failed and we know, both from Scotland and elsewhere, that fan ownership works and that fans are obviously going to be the people with the long-term interests of their clubs closest to their hearts. But it's hard for fans to assemble the money and the structure without, without a right to buy. And these proposals wouldn't force fans to buy, to buy. In fact, there would still be substantial hurdles to doing so. But they would mean that if a well-organised fans trust had the support of the fans, they could secure first right of refusal if the club is being sold anyway, or has, like so many recently, fallen into administration. That's the base proposal, and the key structural elements of that are covered in amendments 1231 to 1238, plus 1240 to 1248. And amendment 1239, which members may wish to vote separately on, would mean that right to buy would apply at any time, giving fans trusts that have clear backing from supporters the ability to make a bid for their club. And this is how they would work. A trust would first express an interest in the purchase of their club and seek to be on the public register of fans trusts. Ministers can reject an application if it's not clear that the trust is predominantly composed of fans of that club or if the trust isn't open to join at an affordable rate or if it isn't clear that members of the trust are sufficiently supportive of a bid to buy the club. And there's also a general public interest test. If the expression of interest is accepted, then fans are assured preferred bidder status for their club if it comes up for sale or goes into administration. Although, again, this must be approved both by a vote of the Trust and Scottish ministers. And if the second amendment is accepted, then they'd be able to buy the club for either an agreed price or an independent valuation at any time. Where more than one Trust applies to buy a particular club, only one may be permitted to proceed. In most cases, this should encourage fans to bring different bodies together to support a bid, as has happened through the Foundation of Hearts. The base amendment also propose, proposes that trusts should be eligible to apply for funding from Scottish Government to assist with a purchase, and it isn't specified in the amendment, but my expectation is that this would likely to, be, to come in the form of loans or underwriting rather than direct grants, especially if fans of larger clubs apply successfully. The last two provisions in the base amendments are to allow an appeal by an owner against the exercise of the right to buy as required by the European Convention on Human Rights and an option to buy a smaller proportion of the shares in a club, particularly where the trust can't afford to buy the club outright. Every party around this table is on record as supporting fans and there will never be a better opportunity to put fans in the driving seat of Scottish football. And I would urge you all to, to support the amendments, and I move Amendment 1231. Thank you very much. I now open it up uh, for debate. Can I call on Stuart Stevenson first, please? Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, convener. Um, I, I don't seek to pick at the underlying principle uh, in this set of uh, amendments, but perhaps just to uh, seek information about uh, the implementation of that principle in the amendments that are before us. Uh, and let me, let me just start by, by, by something perhaps that Central Belt members may have overlooked, um, and that is, of course, the status and uh, issues in relation to Highland League clubs, of which I have three in my parliamentary constituency in Bucky, in uh, Banff and in Fraserburgh. And as we know, uh, Highland League clubs have very successfully been a feeder uh, for, uh, uh, for 
for, for uh, more senior positions, Ross County, uh, my father's previous club, uh, and of course Callie Jags, who were interestingly a merger of two of the three clubs in Inverness, Clachna uh, having refused to come out and play uh, in the merger. And that immediately opens up one of the issues, that there may be circumstances where the purchase uh, actually may not relate to a single club, but be in the circumstances where clubs are merging. And I think the current construction of the amendments that before us probably would exclude action by supporters in those circumstances. And I think perhaps the, the movers of the amendments might uh, uh, care to have a little think about that, because I don't suspect that's actually the intention uh, of, the, uh, of the movers of these uh, 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 amendments. Now, I'm by no means going to cover all the detail, which is very substantial, but perhaps just to show that the, the, there's enough uh, that perhaps some further thinking needs. Um, I, th I think there's a little misunderstanding, perhaps, uh, of how share ownership and voting may not be as easily connected as is thought. Um, the, the, the amendments talk about a majority of the voting shares, uh, and that's fine, but there may be circumstances, and governments, uh, when they've sold off companies, have particularly exercised this right, and it happens in commercial environments as well, where previous owners retain a single share, which, while not having the vote, the, the, the characteristics of a vote that may cause something to happen carry with it the right to veto an action that's being taken. So I think the, the construction of the amendments perhaps doesn't fully address uh, that way in which uh, things may happen. Uh, secondly, the, 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 the amendments talk about uh, the purchase of a majority of a club. And I understand what's intended there. But again, the difficulty is that an individual purchase could well not be about buying a majority of the club at all. It may be about adding to a significant shareholding that creates a majority rather than being a purchase of a majority. And I suspect the movers are not seeking to actually exclude that, but the construction uh, of the, 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 the amendments uh, may, may, may look at that. Um, the other thing which is, of course, uh, possible is there may be circumstances where the transfer of ownership or part of the ownership of the club may take place without any value exchange whatsoever. And I think, again, the movers are unlikely uh, to be seeking to exclude that, although I think one's in very tricky territory there, so I think there's a wee bit uh, more thinking requires to be done. I had a more general question that I, I genuinely don't know the, the, the answer to, um, and that is simply whether in operating with the provisions of the Company Act, which is clearly a reserve matter, uh, we are crossing the line into ultra-virus issues. I'm sure advice will have been taken on that issue. It would be helpful if, if, if the movers of the uh, amendments here were able to uh, perhaps uh, give us the, the comfort that uh, that particular issue has been looked at, because I would hate to see this uh, initiative fall uh, for that particular reason above all. Um, and finally, just a little word of caution about the use of the word fans. Fans come in all shapes of form. I don't think we should discount the idea that David Murray was a fan of, uh, of Rangers, but a fan with sufficient money that he could act alone in what he thought was the club's interest. So I think we need to be very careful about how we talk about fans and how we define fans. Um, I think this is a, a very good and eminently supportable effort in principle, but I think there's maybe further work requires to be done on uh, some of the detail, and I'm not seeking to pretend that I have exhausted all the things I might find if I spent a wee bit more time as a regular member of the committee, rather than someone who was parachuted in at perhaps comparatively late notice. Convener. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, I'm also concerned about the technicalities of this bill, both legal and otherwise. And we raised it at our group meeting, and I would have liked more time to have considered it. However, I just think the principle is agreed, but there is a lack of detail about it. So I slightly share Stuart, my, Stuart Stevenson's uh, disquiet on certain aspects of it. But I think it, it was, it's, it's the legal action that was difficult to, for, 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 to, to, to consider, really. I found the legal action rather, and the technicalities a bit difficult to understand. However, 
um, I'm not uh, of a mind to uh, push that. Coffee, please. Thanks very much, convener, and um, good morning to everyone. And uh, thank Alison Johnson for these amendments, which I'm very broadly supportive of. Uh, I wonder, in her summing up, convener, Alison might refer to give us a little bit more clarity on the problem that fans, groups, and trusts will face in mounting a bid and getting the necessary funding to do that, and at the tail end of that putting in place any finance, perhaps, that might be required to, to make it a successful process. Um, she referred to possible funding eligibility uh, at the beginning of the process in the way or by way of loans or, or underwriting, etc. That's, in my experience, sometimes the stumbling block for fans groups to assemble a credible bid. It's to get sufficient funding together to mount the process to begin with and to demonstrate to all parties concerned that they have uh, sufficient funds to carry it through. So I would welcome a wee bit more clarity on those aspects of, of, of the, the proposer's um, amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Alec Crowley, please. Thanks, Convener. I would certainly want to speak in support of the amendments that, that have been brought forward today. Um, I should say I'm a Kelty Hearts uh, junior football club supporter, but no matter what team you support, if you go regularly to those games, you feel quite passionate about it. And it has been this last few years, I think, disbelief when we've seen um, the events that have taken place in, in some, of the, some of the biggest football clubs, but also some of the, 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 the lower league football clubs, or clubs like Dunfermline, for example. Um, and having, when, when Dunfermline was going through its difficulty, meeting regularly with the fans, um, I knew what they were, they were going through um, as their club... Um, became very close to, to being in, in, uh, put out of business. So, so I think we need to look at the principles of this, these amendments about empowering fans. If there is some technicalities here, if there's, if there's issues in terms of drafting that need to be tightened up, then that could be done as the bill goes forward to stage three. But I think the principle of getting this today onto the, the, the face of the, the bill would be the right thing to do if we can support the principle of this today, support the amendments going forward. And if there is work to be done, that work can be done between now and stage three. Um, so I would certainly want to, 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 to support, and if, if uh, the, the amendments are moved today, we'd certainly be supporting them. Thank you. Ken McIntosh, please. Uh, thank you, Kevina. I also want to speak in uh, support of Amendment 1231 from Alison Johnson and to also speak in favour of all the amendments in this group. This is about extending the right to buy to football clubs and communities across Scotland, and it's a proposal that all of my colleagues in Scottish Labour are proud to support. I believe members of the committee and across the Parliament, in fact, are united in support of the principles behind the Community Empowerment Bill. But in many ways, it is the proposals around community ownership which are the most exciting part of this legislation. Uh, the right to buy introduced through the Land Reform Act uh, has been a hugely important practical as well as symbolic change to the way communities interact to the, with the land they occupy across Scotland. Its benefits have been felt not just in rural areas of the Highlands and Islands, but in urban areas such as Nielsen and East Renfrewshire, where local people, for example, uh, through the Development Trust, now own a wind farm in their community and have actually exer exerted direct influence over the community that they live in and the shape of that community. And I believe it's time we took that experience and those principles to the next stage. And I believe football club ownership is the ideal place to start. I believe it would be difficult for anyone in this room or, frankly, across Scotland to argue uh, that, to stand up and argue that the current state of Scottish football in terms of its accountability, its sustainability or simply its success is a model that should be continued. Successive ownership models, including that of the sugar daddy approach or of foreign oligarchs, have proven an unmitigated disaster and have ruined many once proud local football clubs. Football fans and local communities uh, have not only lost out, they have been made to feel powerless and even taken advantage of and their goodwill exploited. And if you compare that to fan ownership models such as Barcelona or as practiced by virtually every club across Germany, I think we can see that there are some examples which we should be emulating. No one is arguing that fan ownership is the only answer or even the best option in every case, but it deserves at least to be one of the options for the future of Scottish football clubs. Now, I'm not going to repeat the many safeguards and caveats already outlined by Alison Johnson, 
but it is clear that if we accept these amendments, football clubs in Scotland can operate in the fans' interest, in the community's interest, and in the public interest. And I noted the points that both Stuart Stevenson, Cameron Canton and uh, Willie Coffey made, and they were particularly hesitant about the current framing of the clauses before us. Now, I don't, I don't entirely accept uh, the argument that they made, but what's more important about uh, the, the clauses before us is that we accept... I will take Mr Stewart. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Just, Mr. Stewart. just in particular, would you be sympathetic to the idea that we should extend this to uh, Highland League as well as simply... Uh, well, uh, uh, before we've even accepted this particular uh, set of amendments, I'm delighted that Stuart Stevenson wants, wants to accept it and then build on that. But I think that we should take one step at a time and accept this set of proposals for Scottish football, the major Scottish football clubs in Scotland. And I would suggest, uh, again, particularly to Cameron Buchanan, that he's concerned about technicalities, there, there may be minor concerns, but this legislation that's been put before us now is lifted almost whole in its entirety from the Land Reform Act. So this is not new legislation. This is modelled exactly on existing legislation that has been proven to work and has proven to be effective and is practised currently in Scotland. And not only that, it's not a new approach. There are many fans already in Scotland who have bought out their football clubs. And to firmly just be one example. But the current state of legislation in Scotland makes it very difficult for them to do so. It puts all sorts of obstacles in their way. Now, I don't think that we should... Uh, continued in that route. I think that in this case, that if we've got concerns, if we don't adopt it now at stage two, it's very unlikely we'll adopt it at stage three. It's more important that we adopt the principles, accept these amendments uh, at stage two, and then work on the technicalities at stage three. And on that basis, I would urge all members of the committee to support the amendments before them today. Thank you. Minister, please. Uh, convener, and thank you to the members for bringing this forward. I've heard a lot here that I can agree with, and certainly the Scottish Government is extremely positive about supporter involvement and ownership, and it's something we can endorse as an aim. We've already convened a working group under Stephen Morrow, bringing together supporters groups, uh, SFA, SPF, SPFL, and uh, to, to construct a consensus way forward on this. But I can actually personally relate to it. It's not something that's widely known that the, the team I followed in my youth uh, had, a, had financial issues, bad management, bankruptcy, uh, plummeted four divisions and ended up having to uh, re-register under a different name. And before you're assuming what club that is, let me tell you it was the Serie A club, Fiorentina, which shows that these kind of financial problems can happen in a, in a wide range of contexts, a wide range of countries, and it is a, an issue that many football leagues are having to, to grapple with. On reflection and in consultation with colleagues, we are convinced that legislation on this area could be very helpful in ensuring that this aim is advanced. Therefore, it would be our intention at stage three to introduce amendments that would allow uh, much of this to be uh, achieved by regulations mainly, but with an explicit uh, reference in the bill to achieving the aim. This would allow us to consult to co-produce the detail of, uh, of the regulations with supporters groups and ensure that we have a system that doesn't just express the principle and express sympathy, but could actually uh, work. There's a number of issues, really, with the approach of these amendments in detail and in principle. I think in detail, Stuart Stevenson's already brought some of his uh, financial and company law expertise to bear and has presumably only been able to see these amendments for the last few days. These are complex amendments, a new bill almost. A new bill that were it to be introduced as a bill would probably either go to the sport committee or to, uh, under right to buy, to rural affairs. And I do think we need in making such big changes as this to a bill to afford due opportunities for parliamentary scrutiny in respect to, to other uh, subject committees there, as well as the opportunity for widespread public consultation. The Scottish Government hasn't um, been able to consult directly on these in the way that we normally would before we were going to legislate on anything. Yes. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just for clarification, Minister, in today's decisions regarding these amendments, uh, could you give me a clear steer in relation to would you be minded not to accept these amendments today 
or would you be minded to accept his amendments on the basis that the Scottish Government, along with others, can move forward to stage three and bring forward the amendments you would wish to introduce at stage three? I think I am keen, like other members of this committee, to try and get something on the face of the bill at the present moment that we can actually move forward with and, if need be, uh, they can be refined at stage three rather than voting down the amendments that are before us today to then, you know, because we may be in a set similar position at stage three and maybe less so at stage three uh, because we will be considering amendments just a couple of days prior to the stage three debate in the chamber. So would the minister be minded to support the amendments that are before us uh, in the name of Alison Johnson and Ken McIntosh to allow this to move forward and then we can actually work round the issues that have been identified in the amendments presented today. Minister. Can I perhaps get to that? That was an area I was working towards. I, I, I just want to, to highlight the, the issues with the detail here at this point. The, the detail that has been already highlighted is, is in there and if the amendments pass, would be in primary legislation pending the stage three amendments that we would be talking about. Clubs aren't land. A lot of their value is intangible. A lot of their value depends on uh, the players that, that are with them, the, as well as the complex structures of ownership whereby a stadium might be owned by one holding company and something else might be owned by another. In Fiorentina's case, the, uh, state, the stadium was owned by the municipality, which would be an interesting approach that I'd, uh, for the local government committee to take, but I, I don't think we would quite be there in Scotland. The, in that point? Yes. There are some clubs, as I understand it, the grounds are currently owned by the local authorities and the clubs uh, use the, those grounds. So the issue about uh, local authority ownership of football grounds at the present moment in Scotland is already in place. Yeah. One of the difficulties that we've had, and, is that the, and many of the difficulties the fans have had, is trying to distinguish what exactly the club is uh, because you're right, the ground is owned by one uh, company, the the name of the club is owned by someone else uh, and the players are employed by another organisation. So it's trying to, hopefully these amendments would help clarify in Scottish football terms what exactly a football club is and what is that entity rather than at the present moment we seem to have various different corporations claiming to own different parts of clubs and the fans themselves are unaware of what exactly uh, the club co is constituted by in relation to ownership. Uh, my apologies for my slight irreverent aside about local authority ownership of clubs in, uh, of Syria in Italy. I think the point I was aiming at there was made very effectively by the deputy convener who pointed out the complex ownership structures and actually the, the need to get valuation systems right if it is to operate in that way. And if clubs are in the point of insolvency if they then hold for six months pending a fan group coming together. That actually potentially makes liquidation more likely because in that period you may have uh, the flight of players or you may have uh, the inability of other bidders to come in. And you can see unintended consequences here where you might actually end up with more clubs going into liquidation than uh, than is the present time. That's the kind of unintended consequence none of us want to see. That's the kind of unintended consequence we have to make sure the amendments or whatever legislation gets put in place will not lead to. Uh, there is also the issue of the non-league clubs. There's the issue of potentially competing claims, which again is something that is known from uh, land reform. There's no test about whether a community bid would be financially viable. So all of these are important details with the amendments that are here in front of us at the moment. But I, I think there is a principle here. Uh, you know, we want to ensure that fans have greater opportunity to participate in running and the ownership, and we're all on the same uh, page for that. That's great. I believe the better approach broadly would be to include the explicit reference and then to develop through secondary legislation the detail thereafter. Now, can we get this right by stage three? We can certainly further amend if these amendments are passed today in the direction of these amendments, or we could move to the more secondary legislation approach. If we 
take the approach of putting these amendments in and then amending at stage three, there is a lot riding on getting everything right in the next six weeks because it is very hard to amend primary legislation. And indeed, introducing primary legislation requires a process of consultation and development that, for the most part, except in emergency circumstances, usually takes a lot longer than six weeks. So affirmative procedure for the development of the details with the aim put in the bill would allow consultation with the wider footballing community, it would allow consultation appropriately with Parliament, and it would ensure that we don't just endorse the principle, but we ensure that any legislation that was introduced we get right, and also that we can keep that legislation more easily updated in light of developments, changing circumstances, any kinds of uh, experiences we have in uh, implementation. I would hope that everyone could see the benefits of that approach. We will be introducing amendments to that end at stage three because, as I said, we all agree with the aim of increasing supporter involvement and ownership, and we consider that legislation would be helpful in advancing that. In that aim, I would ask the, the members to withdraw the amendments, um, but uh, either way, the, the government will be proceeding that way at, at stage three and putting that before Parliament. Thank you, Minister. Could I call on Alison Johnston to uh, wind up and press her withdrawal, please? Yes, um, thank you very much, Convener. I'd certainly be happy to work with the Minister before Stage 3, but I am afraid that those commitments don't yet cover the essentials of this proposal. Um, I, too, am grateful for the work that Stephen Morrow and his group put in, but they were expressly asked not to look at this issue, which I, I think was unfortunate. I think it's very um, important to note that we have, we initially polled people, 95% of those support a right to buy sale or administration. And in our latest survey, 81% of people supported a right to buy at any time. And a third of those responding were from representatives of fans' trusts. I think it's really important that this is on the face of the bill. The minister has spoken about regulations, but we as a parliament cannot amend those regulations. We can only agree or not agree. Um, I'd just like to, to you know, give you a flavour of some of the support we've received for these proposals. Dave Scott from Nil by Mouth said, they would be supportive of proposals for greater fan control and ownership of their clubs and feel that this could be an exciting opportunity for the silent majority of fans to find their voice and use their increased position to bring about the real changes required to bring the Scottish game into the 21st century. Stuart Duncan, a former director of Greenock Morton Football Club and also of Supporters Direct UK, said, I'm very excited at the prospect of fans being given the right to buy. Clubs, provincial and otherwise, are community assets, as shown by my club, Greenock Morton, who now have a vibrant and highly successful community trust, a fan-led initiative which is, in their own words, the heartbeat of Inverclyde. These community assets are best protected by the people who have the, the club as the hub of the community at heart, the fans. And a Kilmarnock fan said to us that community ownership is one of the few sustainable and viable ways of running football clubs in Scotland. It's fair to say that the bulk of responses from Rangers fans were supportive, but many were also libelous. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to read any of, of those out. Um, Here's one that I think should be safe, though. I support Rangers, so it would avoid a situation arising like the one that arose over the past few years. Rangers fans are the only people who will take proper care of Rangers Football Club. And a St Mirren fan said simply, give us the tools to do the job. Now, I could read out these quotes all day, but I think that would probably guarantee a rejection of my amendments by the committee. Um, concluding... Are you going to give way to the Minister, Ms. Yes, certainly. Sorry. Minister... It's notable that those are sentiments that I think we've all broadly expressed around this committee and that certainly sentiments about a positive approach to supporter ownership that the government would, uh, would endorse. But uh, I don't want to... Well, there is a distinction between those and the amendments in front of us, and I, I do wonder if in quoting those and proposing the amendments when what you're quoting is something we all broadly agree with, you're perhaps manufacturing a disagreement here when we do have an agreement around those principles and those sentiments. Ms Johnson. Yeah, I would say to the Minister that if we have an agreement in principle and we are as supportive as we all purport to be, then please support the amendments today and let's look at the technicalities before stage three. Um, I would like to say that 
If these amendments pass today, I will work with all parties here to achieve consensus on refinements that may be required at stage three about the nature of the organisations that can bid, about the role of Scottish ministers and any other issues that are raised by fans or members. But agreeing these measures today could be the last chance for years for a proper fan-led reform of the Scottish game. If this committee doesn't back fan ownership today, how many clubs will fumble and how many will stumble from one crisis to another? How many will fold? And how many enterprising groups of local people will continue to be shut out of a role? I do urge all members to vote for these amendments today and I'd like to press Amendment 1231. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms Johnston. The question is that Amendment 1231 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, can I call Amendments 1232 to 1248, all in the name of Alison Johnston and all previously debated? Uh, can I ask Alison Johnston to move Amendments 1232 to 1248 on block? Moved. Uh, can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 1232 to 1248? Okay. Um, in which case, are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, can I call amendment 1085 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments 1086, 1249, and 1250. Uh, Minister, can I ask you to move Amendment 1085 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to bring forward Amendments 1085 and 1086 in response to a uh, committee recommendation. Uh, as you know, the aim of the Bill in relation to common good is to increase people's awareness uh, of what property is common good and their involvement in decisions about it. When a local authority proposes to dispose of or change the use of any common good property, the bill requires them to consult people about that change. Specifically, they must notify and seek representations from community councils in the local authority area and any community bodies known to have an interest in the property. Many local authorities have separate common good funds for different towns. We recognise that, especially for authorities that cover a large geographical area, it may be burdensome to consult all the community councils in the local authority area over one common good property. Under the Local Government uh, Scotland Act 1994, local authorities are required to administer their common good property with regard to the interests of the inhabitants of the area to which it relates. This does not apply to the four city councils, since their common good funds cover the whole of their area. The amendment therefore limits the consultation requirement to those community councils whose area covers all or part of the area to which the common good in question relates. As this implements one of the committee's recommendations, in particular arising from the experience of Highland Council, I hope these amendments will be supported. The effect of Cameron Buchanan's amendments would be to remove the requirement for local authorities to have regard to guidance on the management and use of property that forms part of the common good. They would still be required to have regard to guidance on the specific duties imposed by the Bill in relation to common good. And I appreciate that Cameron Buchanan may want local authorities to have more freedom in their management of common good property, but the message I'm hearing, and I know the committee has heard too, is that people do not feel common good is always being managed properly, even when no disposal or change of use is involved. So I think we should retain the option of issuing guidance on any aspect of common good management. And I would ask uh, Mr Buchanan not to move these amendments, and I move Amendment 1085. Thank you. Can I call Cameron Buchanan to speak to Amendment 1249 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you very much indeed. I was going to say that this, was, first of all, was a probing amendment because I think it's all very well that Scottish ministers can issue guidance in relation to the management and use of the property that forms part of the common good, but can you explain, which I think you have done, what form this guidance would take under the present government? And also, would you explain whether the guidance would be technical or would it be a, a policy one? That's, that was the point of it. It's a probing amendment, mine, rather than the... Okay, I see no other hands. So, Minister, would you like to wind up and answer Mr Buchanan's question, if you can, too, please? I'm not sure if I understand the distinction he's aiming to make between policy and technical policy 
guidance can generally be quite technical. I wonder if he could clarify by an intervention. Mr. Buchanan, do you want to intervene? Thank you. No, it, it's, it's really what I wanted to explain what form this guidance would actually take. Mm. It's the word guidance. It's a, it's a, I mean, I'm not going to press it. I just want to know what form it would take. Minister? All guidance is developed in partnership with all those involved. We know there are strong views that have been expressed on common good about the management, maintenance, and we think that having this power here would allow us to try and address some of the uncertainty that is out there and create something that will give both local authorities and communities certainty about what they should be expecting from, from common good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. The question is that Amendment 1085 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, can I call Amendment 1086 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1085. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1086 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The, sec the question is that Section 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1249 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1085. I'm going to quickly. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, are folk content that that's not moved? Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1250 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1085. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Are the committee content? content. Thank you. Uh, the question is that section 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that section 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. Can I call amendment 1164 in the name of Ken McIntosh, grouped with the other amendments shown in the groupings? Can I draw members' attention to the information shown in the groupings about preemptions and direct alternatives in this group? Uh, can I ask Mr McIntosh to move amendment 1164 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. I want to move a number of amendments this morning on the issue of allotments, and I do so on behalf of and with the support of the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society, the key organisation representing plot holders and the allotment community in Scotland. I'd like to begin, in fact, by thanking the members of SAGS for taking the time and effort to brief MSPs, including government ministers, on this important subject. In fact, I believe uh, the minister and I are amongst a number of members who enjoyed the hospitality of SAGS at their uh, uh, international conference centre, which, for those who haven't been there, is in fact a porter cabin with a solar power roof uh, in Inverleith in Edinburgh. I think it's fair to say that SAGS is appreciative of the government's commitment to allotments and of ministerial efforts to offer some statutory protection to allotment sites through the Community Empowerment Bill. I think it's also fair to say, however, that the allotment community is hugely anxious that whatever their good intentions, ministers run the risk of getting it fundamentally wrong with some of the clauses in this bill. To the point that at stage one, I would remind members that SAGS felt plot holders might be better off to scrap part seven of the bill altogether. Now, SAGS have moved on from that position, and, I believe, and they believe that the bill will be a move in the right direction if the Parliament can address three outstanding issues, fair rent, waiting times, and the first of these this morning, the size of a standard allotment plot. At the moment in the bill is introduced, an allotment is defined in section 68D as, quote, of such a size as may be prescribed. However, the pressure on local authorities to meet demand for allotments, a pressure about to become a legal obligation uh, for local authorities to meet in this very bill, has resulted in many councils dividing and subdividing existing plots. The very real fear expressed by SAGS is that unless the size of a plot is defined and protected in statute, local authorities will reduce plot sizes further in order to reduce their waiting lists. This is already happening in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Fife and elsewhere across Scotland. Amendment 1168 in my name requires that the land offered to a potential plot holder will be approximately 250 square metres. That is roughly half the size of this room that we're meeting in, or for those with a sporting bent, roughly the size of a tennis court. SAGS argue that this amendment, defining the size of a standard allotment plot, is essential to protect the unique identity and role of allotments. They point out that if it has been accepted for that it has been accepted for decades, that the amount of land required to provide most of the needs of a family unit is in the region of 250 square metres. 
This space can provide year-round activity for the retired, the unemployed, and they worry that unless it is so defined, plot holders, plot holders may not have access to the area of land necessary for their needs. And I would highlight to the Minister and to members that allotments are a fundamental part of the Scottish Government's food and drink uh, policy to support and encourage people across Scotland to grow your own fruit and veg. 250 square metres would enable a family unit to grow most of their own consumption of fruit and vegetables. A definition of size in primary legislation is necessary to stop local authorities from subdividing plots to reduce their waiting lists, forcing people to accept smaller plots than they require. The allotment community accepts that not everyone needs or wants 250 square metres, but this amendment also ensures that smaller plots can be made available for those that want them, but it is their choice, not one imposing them. The wording will also allow for existing allotments that may be over 250 square metres in size. SAGs have highlighted that whatever her good intentions, they do not support Amendment 1129 submitted by Aileen MacLeod, which contains the words, quote, no more than 250 square metres in area. SAGs are firmly of the belief that the definition no more than 250 square metres will allow local authorities to offer plot sizes that suit them, the providers, rather than the plot holders. Even with, the regulation, even with regulations, it will be up to ministers and the local authorities to determine what is offered under that process, rather than allowing people and the local associations to determine what area they wish to cultivate. And I would remind fellow MSPs that the basic purpose of this bill is supposedly to empower communities, to give people more control over their own lives, and not to have government at whatever level to dictate what people want and need. The basis tenet of the bill is subsidiarity. Edinburgh currently, I believe, has a waiting list of between seven and ten years, but we also know that once people are offered half a plot, that it will be subdivided forever. I urge members to support Amendment 1168 in my name and the consequential amendments 1164 to 1167. And I move Amendment 1164 in my name. Thank you. Minister, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 1229 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you. These amendments address the issue of the size of an allotment. And the fact that we have three different options here reflects the really quite considerable debate there has been on the issue. Allotments have a long and proud history in this country, and several factors distinguish them from other forms of growing, but one of the most important is clearly is the scale. We've worked very closely with the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society in the last few months to understand and wherever possible to meet their needs. We have been listening. While 250 square metres has been discussed as a reference size, I know that the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society recognises that not everybody wants an allotment of that size at all stages of their life. There may be new allotment holders who want to start small and then move up to a larger area later, and there may be others who feel they are no longer able to manage such an area and would welcome a smaller piece of ground to grow on. The amendments in the name of Aileen MacLeod to seek to provide that flexibility. Amendment 1129 would set a maximum size of an allotment at 250 square metres, as Ken McIntosh said, just smaller than a standard size tennis court. Amendment 1230 will require the government to make further provision in secondary legislation in connection with the sizes of allotments. It is our intention that the maximum size would apply prospectively only. Transitional provisions will ensure that existing allotments that are larger than 250 square metres will be protected. This approach seeks, in the definition of an allotment, to clearly give an indication of the scale of allotment growing, as opposed to community growing spaces, which in comparison are predominantly on a much smaller scale, therefore recognising the uniqueness of allotments. But as well as providing flexibility, we will provide security by bringing forward secondary legislation that will make further provisions on size. We will have, through that process, the necessary time to encourage and foster collaborative working relationships between the allotment growing community and allotment providers and the local authority, which in some instances, though not all, are currently strained. This time will allow us to develop secondary legislation that provides that flexibility that everyone agrees is needed, but which has an intended outcome that meets the needs of everybody uh, in all of their interests. Ken McIntosh's amendments do seek the same outcome as the amendment put forward in the name of Dr. MacLeod to establish a maximum size of an allotment. Uh, after all, it is 
uh, broadly a maximum size there, whilst providing flexibility for smaller size all allotments where they are wanted. There is a difficulty with the wording, uh, defining allotment as being of a size of approximately 250 square metres is too imprecise in law for local authorities and tenants to know exactly what it means. Consequently, it would be unclear how subsection 3 of the amendment that refers to meeting a request for a size smaller than that set out in subsection 2 would operate. Additionally, whilst the definition of subsection 3, that an allotment should be whatever size is requested, may appear attractive in principle, this would be impractical on the ground and exceptionally onerous to implement from a local authority's perspective, as you could imagine them having to measure and deliver plots of different sizes to every individual to uh, any level of specificity uh, they might imagine. The amendment in the name of Dr MacLeod is more precise uh, and by bringing forward secondary legislation in this area will provide the necessary time to make sure we get this right to meet the competing needs of everyone. Mr Wilson. Thank you, Premier. Minister, just on the, the points that you are making about the size and the, the, the 250 square metres that has been recommended by SAGS in relation to having a standard size plot. Uh, during our consideration of this bill at stage one, we did discuss the issue about uh, those plots maybe being subdivided, either halved or quartered, to suit the needs of uh, possibly, as Ken McIntosh indicated in his comments, those coming into the allotments or those heading out of in terms of uh, taking up retirement from allotment grown. It's really just in relation to that issue uh, and the size of the issue. Is I'm keen to ensure that any discussions regarding the sizes that are offered are done so in conjunction with the allotment growers society that exists locally. Because what I don't want to see is local authorities offering people the only chance that they may have of having an allotment that may be 50 square metres or 70 square metres, anything below the 250 square metres that's been recommended. So it's really just trying to get clarification from the Minister and the uh, Closing remarks, Minister, in relation to what would be the problem with the agreement to actually set the defined size that we can work with, but ensuring that any negotiations and any offers that are made in relation to the size being given at the first stage is one that is in conjunction with the local allotment grower society so that they are in control of the sizes that are being allocated rather than the local authority in the first instance being the arbiter in terms of the sizes of allotment that is being offered to any new members who wish to take up allotment growing. In this section, the Minister, of course, doesn't have right, closing sorry, remarks. Minister? I'm sorry, I missed your comment there. About I'm saying you don't have closing remarks because uh, the grouping is uh, in Mr McIntosh's name. Was, so on you go. Yes. It was a rather long intervention, but uh, let me uh, be clear that the secondary legislation could deliver that, and I think we would be aiming, at, you know, you've heard from my comments already, the value of the partnership that we want to try and build here, to try and build some bridges between groups that in some cases have, have been strained. Now, ultimately, we can require a lot of consultation, and there is quite strongly in the bill a lot of consultation mechanisms about issues that we will come to, for example, on rent, where we want to emphasise the importance of developing in partnership with, with local growers as well. Um, but the secondary legislation, we think, is a, an opportunity to ensure that that, that happens. Um, we're also talking about, well, we've also committed to a tripartite group with ministers and SAGs that would be taking an overview of this on a, a more national strategic uh, level to ensure that what is happening at the local level is also um, representing the, the needs of everybody and a, a food growing strategy that would emphasise collaborative working. So there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of levers being pulled to try and ensure uh, collaboration uh, both locally and nationally on this because this is an area where if everybody is in trenches uh, taking pot shots at each other, we're not going to get anything done. But if we can manage to find that common ground, we can deliver a system that will be practically implementable, but which will also reflect the views of the people who, who want allotments. And we want more people to have allotments. We're not ashamed to say that. We have to find a way to, to make that happen. 
uh, and to make it happen in a way that everybody on the ground locally uh, can accept. Um, I just wanted to add as well about Cameron Buchanan's amendment that I think leaving the size of uh, allotments entirely for local authorities to determine goes against some of the debates we've been having, the views of the, the stakeholders, what the community are asking us to do and consider. So I would hope that he would at least uh, consider withdrawing that. Uh, but I would urge members to support amendments 1229 and 1230 as the best of two broadly similar uh, options for determining the size of allotments, which is better on being able to be implemented and better on being able to uh, be, be practical uh, way of uh, achieving the, the objectives that we share. Thank you. Can I call Cameron Buchanan to speak to Amendment 1252 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got this amendment is actually stating what local authorities are able to determine allotment sizes within their own area, give the power to the local authority to decide them. I do acknowledge and share the intention that allotment holders should have an allotment of reasonable size. It must recognise the need for flexibility here, which is what I was trying to achieve. I think in order to help allotments to be given to as many people as possible and to minimise the waiting list, which I think is very important, this bill should make it clear that local authorities have the freedom to adjust allotment sizes to fit demand, supply and in all, under all local circumstances. That is the point of my um, amendment. Thank you. Uh, I now open it up to other members. Alec Riley first, please. Hey, thank you, convener. I'm not sure if I should um, declare a, an interest, given that I'm a keen allotment grower. Um, but my experience, and when we were looking at this as the bill went through, my experience in the, the allotments that, where I have an allotment in Kelty, um, has, has been, and I've been fairly, I've often had discussion with council officials about this. I think councils um, need to be more innovative in the way that they try to engage people in allotments, and the problem in, in the Kelty allotments is that over the last few years I've seen quite a number of, interestingly, um, young mums with kids come down and just be given an allotment. And I think my allotment's bigger than half this room, but, and, and they've found it really difficult to then maintain that and manage it. And in talking to some of those, those parents, it's interesting because one of the things that they've wanted to do is actually get the message across to kids that this is how food is produced and how it's grown and there is there is some interesting projects there is a community allotment there is also um, NHS 5 um, through, through one of the mental health projects have allotments there so there is some interesting stuff but I don't think that that the Council certainly in that case have been ambitious enough so when the size thing came up at the, the committee I would have to say that that for me I wasn't quite grasping that, that there, an unforeseen consequence of this bill could be that those that, that, that councils in order to meet the requirements of the bill would just start having smaller allotments um, and, and I was looking at more that councils need to be more innovative and in actually having starter plots um, quarter plots half plots but in order I suppose to do that it is important that, that we do define roughly what a plot is because having looked at this further since the committee looked at it and, and, and talked to allotment holders and I talked to the association, I think there's a genuine concern and I think it is right, it's a genuine concern that councils would meet the legislation simply by reducing the number of the sizes of plots and if that were to happen that would be devastating um, and as, as people get used to, and that's why I talk about starter plots, because as people get used to growing and managing allotments, then they do find that they want to grow um, more um, and as, as, as they become more successful at it. So I would hope that there is a way that we could find, and the Minister has, I think, is acknowledging that, that there is an issue here, and if it is possible to find a way that, that we can ensure that this... this um, maximum size, this, this, this ideal size, is there and councils don't have uh, the, the ability to just simply reduce that in order to meet the legislation. If there's a way of doing that, then I think we should try and find that working together with the government um, as, as we move forward. Alison McInnes, please. 
Oh, convener, I'm grateful to you to give me the opportunity to speak to this group of amendments and just take a moment to reflect on the work that the committee has done in this area. And I've been impressed at the effort members went to to seek um, the views of allotment holders and other interested parties as you went through your um, evidence taken. And the many benefits of allotment gardening are now widely recognised in active lifestyle, healthy eating, healthy ageing, combined with community action, interaction means that those with allotments reap all sorts of benefits. I've been discussing this bill, like many of you, with the Scottish Allotments and Gardens Society, and I am sympathetic to their argument that there needs to be specific provision for the size of allotments, and that will mean land is not unduly divvied up um, to meet demand, while it still retains some flexibility. And I would therefore like to put on record my support for Ken McIntosh's amendment number 1168, which would mean a plot is 250 square metres, unless the person seeking to lease the land requests that it be smaller. The Society notes it's long been held that this is the size of a plot, as Ken has said, that is needed to ensure a family of four could grow most of their own fruit and vegetables. And I know that the Society believes this will help ensure an appropriate balance between the needs of the allotment community and the local authority. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. I just wanted to pose to Ken some quite specific questions um, about the definition of what approximately 250 metres uh, squared means. Does it include 25 metres squared? Does it include 100 metres squared? Does it include 200 metres squared? Does it include 300 metres squared? Does it include 500 metres squared? In other words, how far does the approximation extend? If the definition were, just for the sake of illustration, not because I advocate this, uh, to say between 200 and 300 metres, that would be precise and would be approximately 250 metres. But what the amendment actually says is approximately 250 metres. And I think it'd be helpful to try and understand, you know, at what point does something cease to be approximately 250 metres? Is it as low as 25 metres? Is it as high as 500? These numbers are entirely arbitrary. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Can I call on uh, Ken McIntosh to wind up and press or withdraw, please? Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you very much for all the members for their contribution to this uh, particular uh, set of amendments. Uh, just perhaps going in reverse order, uh, starting with Stuart Stevenson's point, uh, the, the word uh, approximately is well used in legislation, and it is used repeatedly in legislation, and is, uh, there is no difficulty in local authorities, or for that matter, if it came to a court of law, interpreting that word. And what I would suggest is that the term 250 square metres is used because the previous measures uh, included uh, measurements such as poles and other such uh, uh, long gone uh, units of measurements. Uh, th and the size, 250 square metres, is one that's been agreed upon not just by myself and Sags, but by the government. Uh, so the government accept that 250 square metres is the standard size that we are trying to define. So I would suggest that your worries about uh, you know, how far the word approximately stretches uh, is ill-founded in this particular case. The Minister uh, to intervene, are you going sorry, to take I the intervention? Sorry, yes, sorry. I, 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 I'm too softly spoken for my yes, own good yes. sometimes. I was wondering which uh, legislation you'd maybe looked at uh, as the model for this, but also if that has also an interaction with smaller than, which seems to be an issue here because it's not just a case of where does approximately kick in. Is it at 230? Is it at 220? Because there's then a clause that refers to smaller than approximately 250. And that's, that is, if you pardon my saying, a bit of a recipe for confusion. And we wouldn't want something as simple as the size of allotments to end up in courts over interpretation of primary legislation. Uh, again, I was... Thank you, Convener. I was going to come on to that point next. Uh, first of all, the, the, the use of the word approximately, uh, I, I, the, one of the reasons I haven't brought several examples is because there are so many. There are so many uses of the word approximately that it is actually not, it wasn't worth me quoting or listening them to you. So it's a well-used and well-founded term, uh, used by the Scottish Government, in fact. So. Um, and the point the Minister made, the technicality that the Minister questioned, uh, so, so first of all, I do not accept that this will be an issue of contention. I don't believe that there will be a difficulty in either local authorities or allotment holders having any difficulty about defining what is meant when we're seeing approximately 250 square metres. Uh, interestingly, the Minister brought up this idea that uh, uh, the use of the term a size smaller than is not defined. Well, I would suggest it's very clear what a size smaller than means, and I would contrast uh, his 
questioning of the definition of size smaller than, with the support for the other uh, amendment moved by uh, Aileen McLeod that says up to 250 square metres. And I would ask the Minister, what is the difference between up to 250 square metres and a size smaller than 250 square metres? Because in my mind, they are both... Well, I'd be happy to hear yeah. the Minister's... It's a difference between up to 250 and smaller than approximately 250, because where does something cease being smaller than approximately 250 and start to be approximately 250? Is it 220? Is it 230? Is it 210? That's the, that's the, the doubt that is uh, thrown up by the amendment, which I have great sympathy with in uh, terms of its aim. Mr. Minister? Uh, Minister, uh, sorry, Mr. Matatosh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> that stage. Yes, yeah. If only, Mr. Stewart. Uh, uh, can I just suggest that I think that's a fairly spurious point. I, I don't accept. I think if, if you can accept up to 250 square metres, you can accept smaller than uh, 250 square metres. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to give way to Mr. Rowley. Yes. Accepting the principle, and if, I don't know if I was picking up right, but I seem to accept that the government was accepting the principle that, hmm. that the size, that there, there is a standard size around allotments, I, I don't know if you picked that up, but that, that, that yes. seems to be my, my view, that, that if, if we accept the principle of that, is there something that can be worked up here with the government? If we're all accepting the principle, can we, can we work something up going forward, do you think? Indeed, uh, I think that's a very helpful comment. In fact, I wanted to uh, pick up on Mr Early's comment earlier that uh, I believe that there is clearly goodwill. It's clear that the Minister has been listening. He talked about listening to SAGs and others and working with them, and I know he's gone out of his way to meet them and to try to meet their concerns. And I think that Albert really captured the spirit both of this discussion and of the Minister's intention that we can proceed from this stage and stage two to stage three uh, to continue to work and to collaborate and to make sure that we're agreed on these definitions. And the point being here is that we are all agreed. And there is actually not, there is very little contention around the standard size of allotment. We are agreed it should be 250 square metres. And it's whether or not, and I think it comes back to this issue, the two questions, one raised by Cameron uh, Buchanan, another one by John Wilson, about flexibility and control. Because the amendments before us all offer flexibility, but the flexibility or the control as to who exercises the discretion in one case is exercised entirely by the local authority, and in the case of my amendments is exercised by the individuals. It's about empowering individuals, empowering communities. Yes, I'd happy to give way. The difficulty that I have with giving individuals that flexibility is that local authorities or individuals, when offered by a local authority an allotment, may take the size that's given by that local authority because they may see that as the only option they have. And the suggestion I made earlier to the Minister was that the decision to offer smaller sized allotments should be taken in conjunction with the allotment growers society in that area mm -hmm. so that there is no undermining of the authority of the allotment growers society that, that basically then diminishes what we're trying to achieve in terms of the approximate 250 square meter allotment size mm -hmm. because there is a danger that you could actually get people who believe that the, the only will be offered mm -hmm say, 50 square metres or 100 square metres by the, the local authority without any consultation with the Allotment Grower Society that should exist and should be assisting in the management of that allotment area. Mr McIntosh. Yes, no, I, I think Mr Wilson makes a very good point, and it was one very similar to the one that Mr Rowley made earlier, which is that there is undoubtedly uh, a process, and in fact the one that the Minister alluded to about collaboration between local authorities, allotment society and the allotment holder, uh, the, the plot holders, that uh, by innovative thinking, by bringing in uh, starting plots and so on, but by making sure these options are clearly spelled out to those applying for an allotment or for a plot, uh, we can reach uh, exactly the right solution in this case. But I think it's What's crucial and what's captured in my amendment and not in the other amendments is that we put in place this protection that existing allotment holders believe they need. If you go to an allotment, if, for example, if at the Invalith allotment and you have a look round, you can see the standard size allotments, the plots, quite a few of them, but you can also see rows and rows of sheds back to back. And these are the results of subdivided uh, plots where uh, people are being forced onto ever smaller areas of land and it's not necessarily their choice. And in many cases, they would like actually to upsize, but they don't have that opportunity. We are putting in this bill a particular legal obligation, a legal obligation on councils to do something about waiting lists. 
Now, councils will be very acutely aware of their legal responsibilities, and they will act on those to cut waiting lists. And that pressure to cut waiting lists, if they do not have, if they, if they take the easy option, if I may put it that way, rather than find the land that might be needed, is to take the existing allotments and cut them in half and cut them in half again. That is exactly what's happening at the moment, and that's what allotment holders fear. So, and that's the, that's the fear we have to address. And I believe the way to address it is by putting in some protection on the face of the bill in primary legislation now, whilst working with the Minister uh, and the Allotment Society as we approach stage three to further define and further refine how we approach this measure. So I would urge members, uh, in the spirit uh, that we've all taken to approach this measure, to support uh, the amendments in my name. So you're pressing? I am pressing. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1164 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay, uh, in which case we go to the vote. Those in favour of Amendment 1164, please show. And those against 1164, please show. Thank you. Those in favour of uh, Amendment 1164, four. Those against, three. The question is agreed to. Uh, the question is the... Oh. Can I call Amendment 1165 in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated with Amendment 1164? Mr McIntosh, to move or not move? It's moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1165 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, okay, we go to the vote. Those in favour of Amendment 1165, please show. And those against 1165, please show. Those in favour, four. Those against, three. The uh, question is agreed to. Uh, the question is that one, Amendment 1166 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. You, thank you, Mr McIntosh. Uh, are, are we all agreed that 1166 should be agreed to? No. Uh, in which case, we go to the vote. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 1166, please show. And those against, please show. Those in favour, four. Those against, three. The question is agreed to. Can I call Amendment 1167 in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated with Amendment 1164. Uh, Mr McIntosh, to move or not move? Moves, thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1167 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, in which case, we go to the vote. Those in favour of Amendment 1167, please show. And those against 1167, please show. Those in favour, four. Those against, three. The question is uh, agreed to. Can I call Amendment 1251 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, grouped with the other amendments shown on the groupings? Can I draw members' attention to the information shown in the groupings about preemptions in this group? Uh, Mr Buchanan, could you move Amendment 1251 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Thank you very much, Convener. This is concerning making a profit uh, out of the allotments, and I find it very difficult to know how you can define profit when you're selling produce. There are a number of references in this bill that seek to prohibit any profit being made from the allotment's produce. However, it's totally unclear to me why allotments users should be prevented from making a profit. I mean, how do you define profit? Is it when you grow it, uh, when you buy the seeds, when you sell? It's not just a selling price. It's very difficult to define profit. And I think it would be an issue if large retailers were taking up allotments to supply their stores. But that's not what this is about. They're not taking it up. We're talking about members of the public who wish to enjoy the use of allotment space and cultivate vegetable, fruits, herbs or flowers. If this happens to be the case that they have excess produce and wish to sell it, why are we to forbid it? We heard the example of one um, uh, uh, person who's a member of SAGS and they, their allotment, they had a, a sort of a, every weekend, every once a month, they, everybody got together to sell the produce on a particular day openly. And it was not, not like a farmer's market, but in the allotment. So I think, realistically, the allotment users can take a pride in selling their produce that they've worked hard to cultivate. Any profits from, gained from these sort of sales are not intended for a company's balance sheets, but rather a small reward for the labours that they have put in. Furthermore, other areas of this bill, I think they seek to avoid waste of crops and allow for compensation where it is due. 
to simultaneously prohib prohibit any sale of, allot of allotments produce seems to be contradictory. The evidence of avoidance of doubt, my amendments in this regard intend to make it clear that the allotment holders may sell their product for a profit if they wish. Uh, small sales for relatively small amounts of money are not a cog in a corporate supply chain, but instead a chance for waste to be avoided and compensation for hard work to be obtained where it is deserved. Thank you. Um, can I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 1176? Another amendments in the group, please. Thank you. The amendments from Cameron Buchanan would remove the ability of local authorities, uh, it would result in the sale of surplus produce produced on allotments being able to be sold for profit. Additionally, they would remove the ability of local authorities to include provision about the sale of surplus produce in regulations about allotments. This would prevent local authorities from taking account of local factors in determining how surplus produce on the allotments in its area may be sold. These, allotments, these amendments could also have the unintended consequence of bringing allotment holders within the scope of the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 1991, since such production could fall within the definition of agricultural land, which includes land being used for the purposes of a trade or business. That would mean they would fall under an entirely different statutory regime, which is not tailored to allotments. Additionally, the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society have argued very strongly, very strongly, that the purpose of an allotment is to provide self-sufficiency in good food rather than be a means to provide additional income. They consider that any proceeds from sale should only go back into the allotment association to be reinvested in that community of allotment holders. Amendments 1176, 1216 and 1217 lodged in the name of Dr MacLeod loosen the provisions relating to the sale of surplus produce. These amendments remove the need for Scottish ministers to prescribe what produce may be sold and so allow produce of any type to be sold subject to any regulations made by a local authority. These amendments do not affect the definition of an allotment which will still need to be used otherwise and with a view to making a profit. I recognise... Yes. So I'm just trying to get this into my mind. And I know that there are, there are some allotments during the growing season where they'll have a table and they'll have produce there and you'll have people selling that produce maybe for the allotments committee but also maybe to cover the cost of their, their heating and their seeds um, that for bringing the plants on. What you're saying is that would be able to continue the, the bill is specifically intended to allow the sale of surplus produce on a not-for-profit basis. That was a request from stakeholders. What we are trying to do is to ensure that that remains on a not-for-profit basis. If allotments become essentially small, uh, if allotments become essentially small agricultural businesses, that completely changes the nature of them and also the legislation that they would be under. Mr. Buchanan. Thank you. Rick. How does the minister define profit? That's what I was trying to say. I mean, how is profit defined? It's an odd word to use for produce that's being sold, homegrown. I think, again, we have to fall back on the fairly well understood meaning of the word profit in legislation, where there is a, a clear understanding of what constitutes profit under uh, commercial trading and what is a surplus in a not for profit organisation. Those are, those are two relatively. Um, distinct terms that, that we recognise in, in, in organisations that, that work on a, a not-for-profit basis. So this would allow the not-for-profit sale, the, the, the kind of things that we're talking about there, where any proceeds were reinvested in, for example, you know, the, the community of allotment holders, the, the association of allotment holders, and that, that is something that I think we all want to see, but this would prevent the commercialisation um, of allotments. Uh, to, to go back to to where I was, you know, I, I just think that we want to ensure that the ethos of allotments is about community, it's about family, it's about the small scale production for either a social purpose or for your immediate use, rather than opening up perhaps a, a consequence that we don't want of going into the Agricultural Holdings Act. Um, you know, the, the agricultural holdings legislation has its own requirements about leases, rent review, compensation, provides for inheritance, right to buy, dispute resolution to the land court. It's a completely separate area, and I think we want to keep allotments within allotments legislation. Okay. Any other member? No. In which case, uh, Cameron Buchanan can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw, please.
I think I don't need to say any more on the subject, but I would press the amendment in this uh, case. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1251 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, in which case we go to the vote. Those in favour of Amendment 1251, please show. And those against Amendment 1251, please show. Uh, in favour of the amendment one against six, uh, the question is disagreed to. Uh, can I call amendment 1229 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with amendment 1164. Can I remind members that amendments 1229 and 1168 are direct alternatives? That is, both can be agreed to, but if this happens, the text inserted into the bill by amendment 1168 will replace that inserted by amendment 1229. In addition, if either of these amendments is agreed to, amendment 1252 cannot be called. Minister, can I ask you to move formally? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1229 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we're not all agreed. We go to the vote. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 1229, please show. And those against 1229, please show. I'm sorry, but I've got to wait for this bit of paper before I give the result. Time consuming. Those in favour of the amendment three, those against four, uh, the question is disagreed to. Can I call amendment 1168 in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated with amendment 1164. Mr McIntosh, to move or not move? Move, convener. Uh, the question is that amendment 1168 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, okay, we're not agreed. Those in favour of amendment 1168, please show. And those against 1168, please show. Uh, thank you. Those four, four, those against three. The question is uh, agreed to. Um, the question is that section 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I call amendment 1230 in the name of uh, Aileen MacLeod, already debated with amendment 1164? Uh, Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 1230 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1169 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, grouped with Amendments 1170, 1193 and 1194. Minister, can I ask you to move Amendment 1169 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. The bill is introduced allows for a disabled person who has a physical impairment to include information about their needs on the grounds of disability when making a request for an allotment and requires the local authority to include in its annual allotment report information about the number of allotments which are accessible and which have been adjusted during the year to be accessible to a disabled person who has a physical impairment. We have recognised that these provisions should recognise a broader definition of disability. Accordingly, Amendments 1169, 1193 and 1194 remove the reference to a physical impairment, creating instead a broader reference to a disabled person. The Bill at Section 73 already allows a disabled person making a request to lease an allotment to include information about the person's needs relating to access to an allotment or allotment site and about possible adjustments to an allotment that might be needed on grounds of disability. Amendment 1170 extends this provision so that when a request is made by a disabled person for an allotment, it may also include information about the possible adjustments to an allotment site needed by that person on grounds of disability. This will enable local authorities to ensure that the opportunities for growing food on an allotment are open to all, including those with a disability, and to assist this, it will be aware of any possible adjustments that may be needed. These amendments ensure that the provisions on allotments support the equality agenda, and I hope the committee will support them. I move Amendment 1169. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. 
Thank you. Just a brief question to the Minister. I, I hope in his concluding remarks he would be able to confirm the disablement will include disablements that are either temporary or intermittent, as I'm sure we would wish to extend uh, the rights to people in that category. So this one. No, Minister, would you uh, like to wind up, please? The reference would be to a disabled person. I think that would cover uh, anybody who is disabled, whether that is temporarily or otherwise. But I would be happy to, to check that. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1169 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call <coughs> Amendment 1170 in the name of Aileen MacLeod? Uh, already debated with Amendment 1169. Uh, the, can I ask you to move formally, please, Moved. Minister? Uh, the question is that Amendment 1170 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1253 in the name of Cameron Buchanan and a group of it on its own? Uh, Mr Buchanan, can I ask you to move and speak to Amendment 1253, please? Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> As me members can see, this is actually a quite a simple amendment to speed up the process for members of the public who apply to lease an allotment. It can take a long time for people, to, as we heard in many uh, submissions, for someone to move up the allotment waiting list. So the last thing I think people need is unnecessary delays to get the process started. As a result, I propose that the time within the local authority must confirm receipt of a request to lease an allotment is reduced from a lengthy 28 days to a more reasonable 14. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other member wish to enter the debate on this one? A minister, please. Uh, as Cameron Buchanan has said, this would reduce the time for uh, receipt of a request to recent al lease an allotment from 28 to 14 days. I'm happy to support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, the question... Oh, sorry, Cameron, do you wish to wind up and press or withdraw? No, I wish to press, thank very you. obviously. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1253 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, I suggest that we take a comfort break uh, and I suspend uh, till five past eleven. Thank you.
Uh, I now call Amendment 1254 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, grouped with Amendments 1171, 1255 and 1192. Uh, Mr Buchanan, to move uh, Amendment 1254 uh, and speak to all other amendments. Thank you. This is actually another probing amendment because I'm all for the principle that waiting lists should be kept as small as possible so that time kept the time it takes to be given an allotment is minimalised, which follows on from my other, one, uh, other amendment on 1253. But I'm concerned that the, number, that the target for maintaining a number of people on the waiting list, more than half of the total number, number of allotments owned and leased by the authority, will have unwanted consequences that distort incentives. Can the Minister provide insurances, assurances that the target will not place an incentive for local authorities to refuse requests to join the waiting list? Okay. That's really the essential part of it. Thank you, Mr Buchanan. Can I call Ken McIntosh to speak to Amendment 1171 and other amendments in the group, please? Mr McIntosh. Thank you very much, Convener. I want to move Amendment 1171 and also to speak in favour of Amendment 1255 in the name of Alec Rowley. At the moment, Section 72 of the Bill as introduced places a legal duty on local authorities to provide allotments and to take action to deal with waiting lists. It does so by requiring councils to ensure that the number of people waiting for a plot is no greater than half the number of allotments owned and leased by the authority. Amendment 1171 in my name would put in place an additional caveat or stipulation that no one should wait more than five years. Amendment 1255 in the name of my colleague Alec Rowley would ensure that plots are created near the communities that need them and particularly so when these are otherwise socio-economically deprived areas. The Scottish Allotments and Garden Society have estimated that average plot turnover for most allotments is about 5% a year. Even with the 50% trigger point in the bill as introduced, this could easily mean someone waiting 10 years or more for a plot. Several witnesses have testified that the current waiting time in Edinburgh, for example, is somewhere between 7 and 10 years. My amendment creates an additional trigger point or time limit of 5 years. And just to... Um, emphasise that SAGs believe this is a very reasonable request, not an undue burden on local authorities. I believe they originally wanted the amendment to read about three years, but we're willing to compromise on five years. As it is, on reaching the trigger point laid out in the bill, local authorities are only required to take reasonable steps to make additional provision. There are not, these are not absolute deadlines by when additional provision must be provided. I'm sure members are aware of the many benefits provided by allotments to our community. People need a plot for healthy food, to help recover from physical or mental illness, as a family activity with their children, or when facing unemployment or retirement. Allotments offer an opportunity for all of those who wish to enjoy the benefits of gardening and working in the outdoors. It's also very much an issue of social justice. People in areas of multiple deprivation often do not have access to gardens. They should not have to wait 10 years for an allotment, and it's important that in meeting their needs, the geographic area we consider is the local community rather than the entire local authority area. That is the focus of the amendment from Alec Rowley, which I would also urge you to support. I understand that some local authorities are concerned about the availability of land and the cost of developing allotments. However, those fears can be addressed. Very little land is required to fulfil current demand, even in the major cities. To continue the sporting analogy from earlier, an area the size of a football pitch would satisfy the present demand from a settlement of 10,000 people. And Edinburgh's entire waiting list of more than 2,500 people could be accommodated on an area of land less than that required for a golf course. If land is provided and local authorities work in partnership with allotment associations, the funding required to create allotments can be generated from a variety of sources and need not pose a strain on local authority finances. I would ask members to agree amendments 1171 and 1255. Uh, can I call on Alec Rowley to speak to amendment 1255 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you, um, this amendment is supported by the Allotments and Garden Society. The bill currently sets a trigger point above which local authorities are required to take reasonable steps to provide additional allotments. 
This amendment sets a limit on the geographical area for these trigger points, which should be organised around local communities rather than entire local authority areas. I feel that the inclusion of a trigger point in the Bill would be ineffective if those registered to gain access to an allotment are told that they can only access an allotment in an unsuitable location, which is too far from their own community. Um, for example, my own constituency, if somebody in Bullingary is uh, told that they can have an allotment along in Methyl, then, as well as two bus rides in an hour or so to get there and back, um, it just wouldn't be practical, but it would be within the local authority area. So, so I think it, it really needs to do that. Um, as part of a healthy wellbeing and food growing strategy, people should be able to access an allotment within their own community without having to rely on driving or a bus or public transport to get to the allotment. I do not feel this amendment will place an undue burden on local authorities, but I do feel that it will help solidify the trigger point principle which is written within the Bill. I also do hope that, in terms of the, the amendment put forward by Ken Martin, I mean, five years seems like a long time um, to wait. Um, but I know that in, in some communities, particularly in the cities, it's even higher. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of that. But I do, th I do hope that, that what will happen from this bill and the fact that it is here, and I commend the government for bringing forward the allotments um, um, policy within, within this bill, I do hope that it will spur local authorities on to see the importance of the food strategies and growing your own food, um, and that hopefully through time, even five years, will seem um, quite alien. Um, but for now, it's necessary to put it in. So with that, I move. Um, well, I'm happy to move, convener. Uh, Minister, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 1192 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you. These amendments take different approaches to the issue of waiting lists and the provision of allotments. I'm aware that members of the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society have experienced a great level of variability in the performance of local authorities at meeting their current duty to provide allotments. And in developing the bill, the government looked at various ways of framing a revised duty, whether by timescale, by demand, or by population. One key point is that the bill will, for the first time, require local authorities to maintain a waiting list so that demand for allotments is absolutely clear and we have linked the duty to take uh, reasonable steps to provide allotments to the number of people on that waiting list. This seems to us the most appropriate way to frame the duty, linking it to a clear demand for allotments. And I do recognise that the turnover of allotments can be slow and that the SAGs have sought an additional measure based on timescale. However, local authorities have expressed the view that linking the duty to a specific time frame would create a substantial practical burden. That's why we haven't added a timescale to the duty and why I can't support Ken McIntosh's Amendment 1171. What we've proposed in Amendment 1192, lodged in the name of Dr McLeod, my colleague, is that a local authority must include in its annual allotments report the number of persons who have been on its waiting list for a continuous period of more than five years. This would, we believe, lead to substantial pressure to ensure that that number was kept down. This amendment will be supplemented by guidance supporting the bill detailing expectations about waiting times and will ensure that we all in the community and elsewhere have an ability to monitor a local authority's performance. This, in tandem with a strengthened duty to take reasonable steps to provide allotments, has the potential, we believe, to deliver an additional almost 1,000 allotments following the commencement of the Act, based on the information that we have available to us. This, I believe, strikes an appropriate balance between the desire to shorten the time people have to wait for an allotment and the abilities of local authorities. I do note, with some irony, that Ken McIntosh and myself both stood at the COSLA convention on Friday and he uh, made some comments about the Scottish Government wishing to dictate to local authorities from on high and centralised decision making. I believe that this sets the balance uh, the, between practicality and local autonomy. Additionally, Dr McLeod has made a commitment to establish a tripartite group that will meet annually to include the Scottish ministers, local authorities and the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society. This group will assess the progress made on the implementation of Part 7 of the Bill and we hope help to foster that more trusting, more positive, more constructive working relationship that I referred to earlier. 
furthermore, we will also be using as a government the duty in the bill to develop a food growing strategy as a way to progress that constructive partnership between all parties, including local authorities, SAGs and community growers. One of the key areas of discussion we expect, and I don't think anybody would deny, will be the roadmap for how local authorities are going to deliver, how they are going to take reasonable steps, how they will meet the requirement to carry forward the provisions in the bill. And one of the risks that was raised with us was that if local authorities are under pressure to provide more allotments, they might be provided in locations at a distance from those who want them. On that basis, Alec Rowley's amendment 1255, which would make explicit that allotments should be provided where they are wanted, seems a matter of common sense, and I am happy to support it. Cameron Buchanan's amendment 1254 would move the bill in a completely opposite direction from what the government and Ken McIntosh in particular are trying to achieve by lengthening a potential waiting list before the local authority was required to take steps to provide more allotments. I, I don't know if Cameron Buchanan is supporting uh, that flexibility and that uh, longer waiting list that would be at odds with Ken McIntosh's amendments. But to clarify the point that he raised, there are no grounds set out in the bill for refusing a receipt of a request for an allotment to go on a, a waiting list. So there is no question of perverse incentives being set up. Uh, I would ask Cameron Buchanan to withdraw Amendment 1254, having got that clarification from me. But I'd also ask Ken McIntosh, perhaps more in hope than expectation, not to move Amendment 1171. And I urge members to support Amendments 1255 in the name of Alex Rowley and amend Amendment 1192 in the name of Dr McLeod. Thank you, Minister. Any other member wish to enter the debate? Alison McInnes, please. Thank you, Convener. I would like briefly to register my support for Amendments 1171 and 1255 in the name of Ken McIntosh and Alex Rowley, respectively. On the face of it, while these amendments might be perceived as somewhat onerous, the Committee recognised in its own report that much of urban Scotland has parcels of land which are or could be made available for cultivation, but which are currently sitting idle and not being used. And Nourish Scotland told the Committee that less ground is being used for allotments in the whole of Scotland than there is derelict land in Edinburgh. Tackling waiting lists is vital to sustaining a new generation of allotment gardeners. Low turnover, of course, is an indication of success in this case. Um, and Alex Rowley is right to stress the need for provision for folks within their local community. I believe these amendments could foster the process of land reform and encourage local authorities to perceive vacant land as a resource which should be utilised whenever possible. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Cameron Buchanan to wind up and to press her withdrawal, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. In view of what the Minister says about it, it's certainly not my intention to lengthen the waiting list. It was more pres to prescribe the fact that they wouldn't be, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't stay the same. So I withdraw my amendment in view of what your assurance was. The you. committee content that that be withdrawn? Yeah. Uh, in which case, can I call Amendment 1171 in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated? with Amendment 1254. Mr McIntosh, to move or not to move? Uh, just to clarify, do I get a chance to sum up or not? In this no. Case? no. Move or not move? Moved in this case. Moved. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1171 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, in which case we go to the vote. Those in favour of Amendment 1171, please show. And those against 1171, please show. Uh, those in favour, four. Those against, three. The question is uh, agreed to. Uh, I call Amendment 1255 in the name of Alec Rowley. Already debated with Amendment 1254. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1255 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1172 in the name of a uh, Aileen MacLeod and a group on its own? Uh, Minister, to move and speak to the amendment, please. Amendment 1172 lodged in the name of Dr MacLeod will require local authorities to provide reasonable access for tenants of allotments and allotment sites to allotments and allotment sites. This could be via paths, roads and so on. Where a local authority leases an allotment to a tenant, 
the amendment would require the reasonable access to be to that allotment and the site on which it is situated. Where it is an allotment site that is leased, say to an allotment association, the reasonable access would be to that site and allotment situated on it. This is a restatement of section 15 of the Allotment Scotland Act 1922 with amendments and so will not result in any additional burden on local authorities. And this amendment takes forward in part one of the five point propositions uh, put forward by SAGS that sought basic infrastructure, including amongst other things, paths. So I move amendment 172. Thank you. Anyone else wish to enter? No. Uh, Minister, wind up. No. Uh, question is that amendment 1172 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendment 1173 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, group with amendment 1174. Uh, Minister, to move amendment 1173 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you. Amendment 1173, lodged in the name of Dr MacLeod, will require local authorities to make regulations that include a method of determining a fair rent. Following extensive discussion with the Scottish Allotments and Garden Society, this amendment builds on an initial requirement on local authorities to make regulations about allotment sites in their area that include provisions relating to rent, and that this would be uh, developed through extensive consultation. This requires an, a, a local authority. This amendment requires a local authority, when setting its rent levels, to take account of the services that are provided by or on behalf of the local authority to tenants of allotments, the costs of those services, and any circumstance that may affect the ability of a person to pay the rent. This amendment therefore further ensures that those on low incomes will not be dissuaded from participating in growing food on allotments on the basis of a lack of affordability. Amendment 1174 lodged by Ken McIntosh would introduce requirements on regulations about rent which have some similarity to those lodged by Aileen MacLeod. And I would only say that great minds sometimes think alike. Uh, the amendment in the name of Dr MacLeod, we believe, though, goes one step further than Mr McIntosh's proposal and effectively defines affordability, as I said, as circumstances that affect or may affect the ability of a person to pay the rent payable under the lease of an allotment. I recognise that Mr McIntosh's desire to have a statement published by an authority about how affordability has been considered as provided for in subsection 3b of his amendment. Local authorities are, of course, already required to consult before making allotment regulations, and I would think that such a statement could be included in the consultation document. However, if members are concerned that a statement about that affordability should be made more explicit, I am happy to consider that uh, with a view to my colleague uh, Dr MacLeod bringing something forward at stage three. But I would uh, urge the committee to support the amendment in the name of Dr MacLeod, which does uh, seek to achieve broadly the same thing, but does it more precision and I believe uh, stronger safeguards. Uh, so I would move amendment 1173 and I would ask Ken McIntosh, uh, perhaps having made his points and expressed his agreement uh, and the great sense of consensus that is breaking out now on the committee, uh, not to move his amendment. Uh, thank you. Can I call Ken McIntosh to speak to amendment 1174 and other amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Kavina. And allotment and plot holders uh, have long benefited from the protection of a fair rent clause. I suspect, or at least I hope, uh, it was simply an oversight that no such clause was in the original draft of this bill. And without such a clause, of course, there's nothing to stop a local authority from increasing rents, either to generate additional funds or simply to use as a tool to price people off their allotments, thereby, thereby enabling them to reduce their waiting lists. Now, although, as the Minister said, although they are worded differently, the only essential difference, as far as I can see, between the two amendments before us is that uh, the additional clause in the amendment I'm moving, the additional reporting clause in Amendment 1174, which I believe would ensure transparency in the rent process. But I would thank the Minister for his own comments and clearly his acceptance of the fair rent principle. Fair rent is a, a social justice issue. A fair rent that takes into account ability to pay will enable those in deprived areas who wish to do so to contribute to their own food supply. It will help community groups afford to cultivate a plot. And in addition, local allotment associations can work with local authorities to, ter to determine the level of services required and therefore the rent for the site. This kind of devolved management incorporates the basic principles of community empowerment and partnership working. 
As the Minister also alluded, uh, allotments can contribute to government policy on food, on social justice, health and wellbeing, reducing carbon emissions and enhancing the natural environment. And I think we're all agreed that rent should be set to enable those on low income to participate and not be excluded. And I would uh, urge members to support either amendment. I believe the only difference is one has a reporting clause, but both capture the essence of fair rent. Thank you. Minister, to wind up, please. Yes, uh, to provide a, a slight insight, the concern about the fair rent clause that had existed before was that it hadn't been very precisely defined and there wasn't really an understanding out there or indeed in legislation about what a fair rent would be or how that could be tested, which I think emphasises the importance of having quite uh, precise legislation here. I would also say that uh, the, the clause from uh, the section from Aileen McLeod uses the phrase fair rent, which makes it very, very clear what, it, what is being uh, intended and uh, would allow that level of acceptance from the community that I think uh, we really need to have in the allotments legislation. So I would hope that uh, members would support uh, Amendment 1173 with the commitment to include the reporting clause at stage three. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1173 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1174 in the name of Ken McIntosh, already debated with Amendment 1173. Mr McIntosh, to move or not move? Not moved. Are the committee content with that? Content. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1175 in the name of Ailey MacLeod, group with Amendments 1177, 1190, 1191 and 1218. Minister, to move Amendment 1175 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. This is a group of minor amendments relating to allotment site regulations, annual reports and the removal of items from an allotment by the tenant. 1175 is simply to tidy the drafting and remove repetition. 1177 relates to section 73.5, which provides that local authority regulations may make different provision for different areas or different types of allotment site. The amendment removes the words types of so that different regulations can be made for any allotment site. 1190 and 1191 are about the annual report which local authorities are required to prepare and publish under section 79. Under subsection 2c, a local authority must set out the proportion of the land on each site used for allotments as opposed to communal areas within the site that is not leased from the authority. These amendments split the paragraph to ensure that information about the proportion of allotments that are unlet is reported both for sites on which a local authority leases allotments directly and for sites which a local authority leases to one person, such as an allotment association, and that person then subleases the allotments. Section 88 sets out the items a tenant may remove from an allotment before the end of the lease, which include any buildings or other structures erected by or on behalf of the tenant. Amendment 1218 expands this to also include any buildings or other structures acquired by the tenant. Uh, I move Amendment 1175 and I ask the committee to support it and the other amendments in the group. Thank you. I uh, see no one else. Uh, Minister, do you waive your right to wind up? Yeah. The question is that Amendment 1175 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1256 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1251. Uh, can I remind members that if Amendment 1256 is agreed to, you cannot call, uh, that I cannot call Amendment 1176. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, to move or not move, please. Move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1256 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, in which case we go to the vote. Those in favour of Amendment 1256, please show. Uh, and those against 1256, please show. Those in favour, one. Those against, six. The question is disagreed to. Can I call Amendment 1176 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1251. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1176 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1177 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1175. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1177 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Thank you. The question is that section 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed. The question is that section 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Uh, can I call amendment 1178 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, grouped with the other amendments shown on the groupings? Minister, could you move amendment 1178 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? These amendments relate to the circumstances where a local authority proposes to dispose of or change the use of an allotment site it owns or proposes to renounce the lease or change the use of an allotment site it leases. The majority of the amendments clarify that these provisions apply whether the local authority proposals relate to the whole or part of the allotment site. The current provisions require a local authority in these circumstances to offer a tenant of an allotment an alternative allotment in the local authority area unless ministers were to be satisfied that this is unnecessary or not reasonably practicable. Amendments 1182 and 1188 broaden the duty to include that a tenant may be offered an allotment on the same allotment site as well as an alternative site so that if only part of a site is disposed of, the tenant may be offered an alternative allotment on the same site. I ask the committee to support these amendments and I move amendment 1178. Thank you. I see no one else. Uh, you waive your right to sum up, Minister. Thank you. The question is that amendment 1178 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendment 1179 in the name of Aileen MacLeod? Already debated with Amendment 1178. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1179 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1180 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, grouped with the other amendments shown on the groupings? Uh, can I draw members' attention to the information shown in the groupings about preemptions in this group? Minister, uh, could you move Amendment 1180 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? The allotment community have been very clear that allotment sites should be protected whether they are on land owned by a local authority or leased by a local authority. And this position has been supported through public consultation. Uh, we have been listening and included provisions in the bill that build on the existing uh, protection against change of use of allotments without ministerial consent that is provided in section 73 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. The provisions in the bill, as set out at section 75 and 76, provide protection for allotments against disposal, change of use, and where the land is leased by a local authority for allotments, renunciation of the lease without the Scottish Minister's consent. In addition, section 84 provides protection against the resumption of possession of the whole or part of an allotment or an allotment site that is let by a local authority without the Scottish Minister's consent. In each case, the Scottish Minister's consent may only be granted where each tenant is to be offered an alternative allotment unless that is unnecessary or not reasonably practicable. Amendments 1180 and 1186 in Aileen MacLeod's name will in addition require Scottish Ministers to consult with the local authority and any other person appearing to have an interest before making any such decision about providing consent. This will allow all parties to have their say on any such proposals. Amendments 1183 and 1189 clarify the consequences of an authority transferring ownership or renouncing a lease of an allotment site without ministerial consent. They provide that such a transfer or renunciation will have no effect without that ministerial consent. Cameron Buchanan's amendments in this group would remove the requirement for local authorities to obtain the Scottish Minister's consent before disposing of, changing the use of, renouncing the lease of, or resuming possession of an allotment site. Removing that requirement for ministerial consent would be contrary to everything that allotment holders have told us they want in terms of protecting allotment sites from closure, and I would urge the committee to reject those amendments. I ask the committee to support amendments 1180, 1183, 1186 and 1189, and I move amendment 1180. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan to speak to amendment 1257 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you. The point of this amendment was to enable local authority to dispose or change of use of an owned allotment site independently without necessarily the consent of the Scottish ministers. I think this would be a productive change for two reasons. Firstly, removing the need for ministerial consent would prevent the status of allotment sites being struck in a deadlock, stuck in a deadlock between opposing local and national administrations. 
Secondly, I think it is likely that local authorities would be less willing to open up new allotment sites if they were from then onwards unable to decide what to do with the land themselves. If local authorities were able to decide for themselves what to do with the allotment sites, as my amendments would achieve, this effect would be maybe that more allotment sites are opened up for use. With control staying in their hands, it is likely that local authorities would be more willing to use the land as an allotment site in the first place. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, committee. Just some technical questions. Uh, first one of which, um, it would be helpful if the minister could just confirm to the committee that the definition of land uh, does, as it elsewhere in legislation does, include water, be that standing water, river, uh, ditch, tidal water, or, or any other form. Um, and perhaps also uh, whether... The, the, the legislation uh, that we, we, we the, the amendment and the legislation in general it also will prevent uh, acquisition uh, of uh, allotment land and its removal from being allotment uh, for purposes of way leave or by the Ministry of Defence or other UK bodies um, that, uh, that have rights to acquire land. Please, Mr. Stevenson, keeping you on your toes yes. as per usual. Yes. Uh, believe it or not, the standard legal definition of land does include water. And uh, the section 75 that is the subject of our concern here says, uh, refers to allotment sites, which are defined in 69. Uh, in this part, allotment site means land consisting wholly or partly of allotments. Now, I We'll consult with the lawyers later to check, but I would assume, therefore, that if that included a, a stream running through uh, an area that was mainly uh, comprised, or indeed wholly or partly of allotments, that that would be included as part of the overall allotment site, which is the bit that is being operationalised under this. Mm -hmm. Mr Stevenson. Uh, just to make clear, my, my concern is primarily that the path of uh, things like rivers can vary, so nature can modify what is on an allotment site. And it's that particular context I have in my mind, although clearly there could be others. I think that is one of those issues I will undertake to go away and reflect on. Um, I, I do actually have an allotment site that is next to a body of water in my constituency and where that to flood. I'm not sure what the uh, effects would be in legislation, but I'm happy to think about it. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1180 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendments 1181, 1182 and 1183, all in the name of Aileen MacLeod and all previously debated? Can I ask the Minister to move Amendments 1181 to 1183 on block, please? Moved on block. Thank you. Uh, can I ask if any member objects to a single question being put in Amendments 1181 to 1183? No. Uh, in which case, uh, can I ask that members agree? Uh, 1181 to 1183. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1257 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1180. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? I have not moved. Uh, are the committee content with that? Yeah. The question is that... Sorry, I beg your pardon. Can I call Amendments uh, 1184, 1185, 1186, 1187, 1188 and 1189? all in the name of Aileen MacLeod and all previously debated. Uh, Minister, can I ask you to move the amendments 1184 to 1189 on block, please? Moved on block. Uh, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 1184 to 1189? Uh, the question is that amendments 1184 to 1189 be, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Can I call Amendment 1258 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1180. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Sorry. Are the committee content with that? Yes. Uh, thank you. Can I call Amendment... Oh. 
can I ask that section 76 be agreed to? Agreed. Thank you. Can I call amendment 1259 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, grouped with amendments 1260, 1262 and 1263. Uh, Mr Buchanan, to move amendment 1259 and to speak to all amendments in the group, please. This is to replace the word must with may and not make it too prescriptive. That's all I really have to say on it. It's, it's Thank you. Anyone else? No? Minister? Uh, amendment 1259, as was stated, uh, would replace the duty for each local authority to prepare a food growing strategy and instead make it an optional power. Uh, amendments 1260, 1262 and 1263 would remove the requirements on local authorities about publishing a food growing strategy and its duty to review the strategy at least every five years. I have heard from allotment holders that they have experienced variability in the performance of local authorities in delivering their current duty to provide allotments and that they have found it difficult in some cases to engage with their authority on this issue. The duty to prepare and review a food growing strategy is a key way to bring together the allotment community with local authorities and community growers as a means to develop and progress positive partnerships and relationships between all of them. And in addition, during a public consultation in November 2013, there was strong agreement from respondents that one of a local authority's duties should be this, to produce a food growing strategy and review it every five years. Making it an option for each local authority to prepare a food growing strategy will also mean that a local authority will not be required to describe how it intends to increase provision of allotments to meet its duty to take reasonable steps to meet demand. I would also add that in light of our previous discussions on the power to advance well-being, there is nothing to stop a local authority right now using um, its discretion to implement and create a food growing strategy. The effect of Cameron Buchanan's amendments would therefore be to essentially make no difference to, to whether the, the sections were in the bill at all. I believe it's important that we make a local authority accountable in relation to this duty and that the duty remains. I ask uh, Mr Buchanan to withdraw Amendment 1259 and not move the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Mr Buchanan, to wind up and press her withdraw, please. Thank you very much, Convener. I think this removes the obligation on local authorities to prepare a food growing strategy. I think it would be very burdensome for them to have it and detract from other duties. And I would just make it a possibility rather than a problem, rather than a necessity. I've submitted these amendments to remove the obligation on local authorities to prepare and publish a food growing strategy on the basis that it would be burdensome. And I think it would be better use of local authorities' time and resources to focus on providing allotments and minimise waiting lists rather than compiling documents to comply with a rather centrally imposed duty. I'm sure that most people would agree that local authorities should be judged on their ability to provide and maintain allotments rather than their ability to compile a document. Should a certain council wish to spend their resources on publishing a food growing strategy, it should be a decision for that particular council to make and not that hence the idea of taking a may rather than a must. Thank you very much. Sorry, I would I like to, you could you take it, I'm moving it, yes. You're pressing. Pressing, okay, thank you. Thank you. The question is that amendment 1259 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Thank you. Uh, those in favour of amendment 1259, please show. And those against Amendment 1259, please show. Those in favour of Amendment 1259, one. Those against, six. The question is disagreed to. Uh, can I call Amendment 1260 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1259. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Are the committee content with that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1261 in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with Amendment 1265. Uh, Mr Rowley, to move Amendment 1261 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, people can use an allotment plot to grow healthy food to help recover from physical or mental illness as a family activity with their children or when facing unemployment or retirement or simply because they enjoy growing food and giving it away. Allotments offer an opportunity for all those who wish to enjoy the benefits of gardening and working in the outdoors. 
Amendment 1261 will ensure that it is part of a local authority's duty to prepare a food grown strategy and identify land which it considers may be used uh, for allotment sites and or community cultivation. It will also be required to describe whether and how this will increase provision in areas affected by socio-economic disadvantage and many senses linking it to the local community plans um, because, because growing food there are many um, projects such as healthy eating strategies, healthy eating projects, cooking projects that already exist as part of um, a health and wellbeing um, approach by local authorities. This would simply mean that, that local authorities would identify particularly areas of disadvantage. Communities where there is high levels of disadvantage should have access to growing sites and therefore I believe it is important that the local authority identify this as part of their food growing strategy. Amendment 1265 will ensure local authorities pay particular regard to communities where there is a high level of socio-economic disadvantage when looking to promote allotments and in providing training to tenants or potential tenants. Again, this amendment will ensure that those communities which may benefit the most from allotments, but are often the hardest to reach citizens, know that about allotments um, and have the skills and training to be able to access those allotments. Um, happy to move um, Amendment 1261. Thank you, Mr Rowley. Minister, please. Mr Rowley is right to draw the connection between the amendments that were lodged by the government uh, on community planning and these ones, I, I welcome them that they will continue to develop the theme of targeting uh, or ensuring that the provisions do explicitly address socio-economic disadvantage and inequalities. We know that where people have the opportunity to grow their own food, it can help to tackle not just food poverty, but also issues like physical and mental health and social isolation. So these amendments will ensure that local authorities are thinking about the areas which uh, experience socio-economic disadvantage when they're looking at provision both of allotments and other land for community growing. Growing your own food has benefits for everyone and Amendment 1265 will encourage local authorities to promote allotments and provide rate related training to disadvantaged communities to ensure they see it as something that is for them as well. The lawyers tell me that they may need to look at some of the wording at stage three. Mr Rowley nods, he knows those sorts of caveats are quite familiar by now, but I would uh, urge the committee to support what are a set of very helpful amendments. Thank you. Mr Rowley, do you want to wind up and press or withdraw? Um, yeah, thank you for the, the, the... We seem to be in agreement. Um, and um, I think this being part of the community planning um, approach is the right one. Um, and we'll see what happens at stage three. So happy to move. OK. The question is that Amendment 1261 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1262 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1259? Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Sorry. Are the committee content with that? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1263 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1259. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Are the committee content with that? Yes. Uh, can I ask that Section 78 be agreed to? Agreed, yes. Thank you. Can I call amendment, uh, Amendments 1190, 1191, 1192, 1193 and 1194? all in the name of Aileen MacLeod and all previously debated. Minister, could you move the amendments on block, please? Moved on block. Thank you. Uh, does any member have an objection to a single question be input on these amendments? Uh, in which case, the question is that amendments 1190 to 1194 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is that section 79 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I call amendment 1195 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, grouped with amendments 1196, 1197 and 1264. Minister, to move amendment 1195 and to speak to all amendments in the group, please. 
Thank you. Section 81 of the Bill as stands allows a person representing the interests of allotment tenants, such as an allotments association, to request that a local authority delegates management functions of an allotment site to them. All the amendments in this group are minor adjustments to that section. 1195 clarifies the allotment sites to which the section applies. Amendment 1197 is a consequential amendment to remove duplication. 1196 makes clear that the person applying for delegation of, a management, of the management of a site should represent all or a majority of the tenants. Uh, turning to Cameron Buchanan, uh, a further provision of Section 81 enables a local authority to agree to or refuse the request. If the local authority refuses the request, it must provide reasons for its decision. The amendment lodged by Mr Buchanan would require that the reasons for refusing the request must be, quote, valid, unquote. It is not necessary to include the word valid. Local authorities are already under a common law duty to act reasonably and make rational decisions or face the risk of judicial review. Both the taking of decisions about delegation of management and the duty to give reasons must be exercised reasonably. The offering of invalid reasons, I think, would be quite a strong example of not uh, acting reasonably. In addition, it is unclear who it is that would determine what constitutes a valid reason for refusing a request. The inclusion of valid in this context is therefore unnecessary, but also creates a, a lack of clarity. And I would ask Cameron Buchanan to, to withdraw the amendment, and I would ask the committee to support the amendments in the name of Aileen MacLeod, and I move Amendment 1195. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan to speak to Amendment 1264 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you. In view of what the Minister has said, I, um, my reason for this is a rather probing, another probing amendment, because I wanted to, to see what the, if the local authority is going to send an applicant a decision notice setting out the reasons for refusal. That was really my reason for it, and I would like just a bit of clarification on that. Please. Well, as I say, if the local authority were to offer invalid reasons or, or reasons that were not worthy of respect or were unreasonable, then there would be uh, consequences for that. So I consider the word valid to be unnecessary. Thank you. Can I call... Uh, the question is that Amendment 1195 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1196 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1195. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1196 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1197 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated uh, with Amendment 1195. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1197 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 1264 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1195. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, are the committee content with that? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1265 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1261. Mr Rowley, to move or not move, please? Uh, the question is that Amendment 1265 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1198 in the name of Aileen MacLeod in a group on its own? Uh, Minister, could I ask you to speak and move the amendment, please? Amendment 1198, lodged in the name of Dr MacLeod, introduces a new provision in the Bill. The amendment allows tenants of an allotment site or their representative to request the use of, a local, of local authority premises free of charge. The premises may be used solely for holding meetings to discuss allotment site related business. The amendment is a restatement of section 15 of the Allotments Scotland Act 1892 with some amendments. The amendment is being brought forward in the name of Dr MacLeod as initial views suggested that allotment holders, like other community organisations, should pay for the use uh, of a local authority uh, uh, space. However, given that allotment holders have no means of raising revenue for the hire of such spaces, this provision is being brought forward as an amendment. I move Amendment 1198. Thank you. Uh, Mr Wilson, please. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Minister, just seek clarification in terms of the what's proposed here, because what we have in many local authorities, uh, the premises that would have 
normally been used by allotment growers have now been either transferred over to alio control or other control out with direct control of the local authority. Uh, and it's just to ask whether or not the definition of local authority premises would include premises such as you know, in the local authority area that I live in, uh, most of the uh, schools have been transferred to either a culture or alio or a leisure alio, uh, which incur charges for most organisations and are not directly, as the local authority would argue, controlled by the local authority at the time that they are actually operated by those alios. So can you seek clarification uh, from the Minister in relation to any costs that may be incurred uh, for the use of those premises where they are practical and close to uh, where the allotment uh, is, or the allotments are based? Anyone else wish to enter the debate? It took us a farewell to get to my old friend, the Allotment Scotland Act, 1892 today. Um, uh, Minister, do you want to wind up, please? Yes. Uh, in response to uh, uh, the question, would, uh, I will have to examine it. But as with my uh, statement in previous uh, committee session on including alios, I certainly would want something that was recognisably and demonstrably a community building that was local authority controlled. However, it did that to be included within the, the bill. So uh, we will check the definition and if the definition does need expanded, we will uh, do so. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1198 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1199 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, group with the other amendments shown in the groupings? Can I draw members' attention to the information shown in the groupings about preemptions in this group? Minister, to move Amendment 1199 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. This group of amendments is to clarify the provisions in section 83 and 84. Section 83.1 sets out the circumstances in which a local authority may terminate the lease of an allotment or an allotment site. Amendments 1199, 1200 and 1201 clarify that these circumstances override any provision in the lease to the contrary about termination of the lease and that these are the only circumstances in which a lease can be terminated. Section 84.2 sets out the circumstances in which a local authority may resume possession of the whole or part of an allotment or allotment site and requires that the Scottish ministers must give consent to any such resumption. Amendments 1202 and 1203 clarify that these circumstances override any provision in the least to the contrary about resumption and that these are the only circumstances in which possession may be resumed. Amendments 1204 and 1205 have the effect of providing that it is the giving of notice of resumption to which the Scottish ministers must consent rather than the resumption itself. I would ask the committee to agree to these clarifying amendments and I move amendment 1199. Thank you. Um, I see no one else. You waive your right to wind up, Minister. Uh, the question is that amendment 1199 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1200 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated? Uh, Minister, to formally move, please. Formally moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1200 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1201, uh, already debated? Minister, move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1201 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1266 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1180. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Please. Not moved. Are the committee content with that? Agreed. Thank you. The question is that Section 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1202 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1199. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1202 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I call Amendment 1203 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1199. Uh, Minister, move formally, please. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1203 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1204 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated uh, with Amendment 1199? Uh, can I remind members that if Amendment 1204 is agreed to, 
Uh, you cannot call uh, that I cannot call amendment 1267 minister move firmly please moved the question is that amendment 1204 be agreed to are we all agreed, agreed. Uh, in which no. case we go to the vote uh, those in favor of amendment 1204 please show and those against 1204 please show Those in favour, six. Those against, one. The question is agreed to. Uh, can I call amendment 1205 in the name of Aileen MacLeod? Already debated with amendment 1199. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Uh, the question is that amendment 1205 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call amendment 1268 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with amendment 1180. Uh, Mr Buchanan, to move or not move, please. Moved. Uh, the question is that amendment 1268 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, then we go to the vote. Those in favour of amendment 1268, please show. And those against, 1268, please show. Those in favour, one. Those against, six. The question is disagreed to. Um, the question is that section 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendment 1206 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, group with the other amendments shown in the groupings? Minister, to move amendment 1206, please, and, all, and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. This group of amendments is to clarify the provisions of sections 85 and 86. Section 85 deals with the arrangements for a notice of termination where a local authority leases an allotment site from another person and receives notice of termination of that lease. Amendment 1206 clarifies that Section 85 applies where the local authority leases an allotment site and is granted a sublease either to an allotment association for the whole site or to an individual for an allotment. Amendments 1207 and 1208 clarify that the notice received by the local authority may relate to the termination of either the whole or part of its lease. Amendment 1209 and 1210 uh, set out that the affected subtenants should be notified of the date of termination and that their subleases are terminated on that date. Section 86 deals with arrangements for notice of termination where the local authority leases a site to a tenant, such as an allotment association who represents the interests of subtenants. Amendments 1211, 1212 and 1213 clarify the circumstances in which section 86 applies and that the notice may relate to either the whole or part of an allotment site. Amendment 1214 sets out that in these circumstances the tenant must notify each subtenant of the date the whole or part of the lease is terminated and that their sublease is terminated on that date. I would ask the committee to agree to these clarifying amendments and I move amendment 1206. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go straight to the question then. The question is that amendment 1206 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendments 1207, 1208, 1209 and 1210? All in the name of uh, Aileen MacLeod and all previously debated. Minister, could I ask you to move amendments 1207 to 1210 on block, please? Moved on block. Thank you. Uh, does any member object if I put one question? No. Uh, in which case, the question is that amendments 1207 to 1210 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The question is that section 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendments 1211, 1212, 1213 and 1214, all in the name of Aileen MacLeod and all previously debated. Minister, would you like to move those amendments on block, please? Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put in these amendments? Yeah. Uh, the question is that amendments 1211 to 1214 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Thank you. This question is that section 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1215 in the name of Aileen MacLeod and a group on its own? Uh, Minister, to move and speak to the amendment, please. Thank you, Convener. And can I reacquaint you with your old friend, the Allotments Scotland Act 1892? Uh, this amendment restates, uh, with some amendments, Section 73 of that Act, which prohibits the subletting of allotments by a tenant. The amendment expands that provision to include the, pro uh, the prohibition of assignation of an allotment without the local authority's consent. Additionally, the amendment identifies the consequence of such actions resulting in the transactions being of no effect. Given that the provisions in Part 7 of the Bill will provide greater transparency on the actions of a local, uh, a local authority is taking to meet demand for allotments in its area, and that an authority will be required to report annually on allotment provision in its area, it is essential that a local authority is able to identify who is responsible for the upkeep of and growing food on any allotment in its area. Amendment 1215 will ensure that local authorities are able to identify the tenant of an allotment, and I move the amendment. Thank you. Anyone else wish to enter the debate? Uh, the question is that Amendment 1215 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, can I call Amendment 1216 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1251. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1216 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, thank you. Can I call Amendment 1269 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1251. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move, please. Uh, not moved. Uh, are the committee content with that? Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1217 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1251. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1217 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1218 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1175. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Is that Amendment 1218 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1219 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, group with Amendments 1220, 1221, 1270 and 122? Minister to move Amendment 1219 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you. The amendments in this group under Dr MacLeod's name are minor and technical amendments. Section 91 of the Bill as it stands provides that if a local authority resumes possession of an allotment or part of an allotment, then the local authority is required to compensate the tenant for loss of any crop by the tenant as a result of the resumption. The period of notice required for resumption in Section 84 of the Bill is at least three months. Amendments 1219 and 1220 adjust the provisions to provide that it is the local authority who gives notice or who has uh, received notice of termination of their own lease of the site that is liable to pay compensation to the tenant. This is to ensure that it is the local authority with whom the tenant has the lease who are responsible for paying compensation, even if the local authority has granted a lease out with their own area. Amendments 1221 and 1222 are just minor corrections. I would ask the committee to support the amendments in Aileen MacLeod's name. Amendment 1270, lodged by Cameron Buchanan, however, would provide that a local authority would not be liable to pay a tenant compensation for loss of crops if the tenant had a reasonable opportunity to remove their crop prior to the land being resumed. I would argue that the three-month notice period specified in the bill is a reasonable opportunity if the crop is harvested or ready for harvest at the right time. The amendment, however, fails to take account of the seasonal cycle of food production on allotments. Uh, some crops may have just been put in the ground at the time of the notice being served and so may not be ready for harvest once the notice period is up. Additionally, fruit trees are normally planted in late autumn, early winter, uh, if there is no ground frost and wouldn't yield a crop until the summer. So a period of notice given at point during the planting season and even into early spring would mean that a tenant has made the investment in the tree but suffers uh, a loss of crop. Section 91 requires Scottish ministers to make regulations about compensation of loss of crops following resumption, and Scottish ministers must consult 
before making these regulations. The regulations must make provision about the procedure for compensating for loss of crops and an assessment of the amount of compensation for which the authority is liable. This provides safeguards both for the local authority and tenants and will be an important piece of legislation to get right. I ask Cameron Buchanan not to move Amendment 1270 and I move Amendment 1219. Thank you very much, Mr Buchanan. To speak to Amendment 1270 and other amendments in the group, please. You. In view of the Minister's comments, I would not wish to press this amendment. Uh, at a later stage. Oh. Uh, anyone else? Minister? Do you wish to wind up? No, you wave your right. The question is that Amendment 1219 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1220? Uh, in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 1219. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1220 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, the question is that Section 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I call Amendment 1221 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 1219. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1221 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Can I call Amendment 1270 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1219. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move, please? Not moved. Are the committee content with that? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I call Amendment 122 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, already debated with Amendment 1219. Minister, to move formally, please? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1222 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1223 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 1224. Minister, to move Amendment 1223 and to speak to both amendments in the group, please. I'm delighted to move these two amendments in my name. Uh, one to Two, three is a new regulation making power enabling ministers to require Scottish public authorities, including the Scottish Government, to promote and uh, support the facili and facilitate the participation of members of the public in the decisions and activities of the authority, including in the allocation of its resources. This, we believe, would uh, support participatory budgeting in particular. We know that involving people and communities in making decisions helps build community capacity and also helps the public sector identify local needs and target budgets more effectively. We know that decisions taken closer to people by the participation of people affected are better decisions. And it is clear that when people know they have a genuine say in an issue that matters, they will get involved. Our job is to make it clear that they know their voice matters. This has been a big concern for the committee and it's been a big concern for me. How to give people and communities more opportunity to have their say in the decisions that matter to them. How to make real that objective of community empowerment. The intention is that the new power will ensure that participatory activity takes place and the associated guidance will drive the quality and depth of this participatory activity over time. And I wanted any legislative solution to have the flexibility to build and change and develop over time. Given the different functions and the different budgets and the different structures of local uh, and public authorities, I knew that having a single approach would not endure. So the amendment through regulations will not only provide that promotion and facilitation of participation takes place by Scotland's public bodies, but that we can refine the regulations so that participation is relevant for the activities of each public body in their distinct role. In addition, ministers through the regulations will be able to require public bodies to prepare and publish a report describing the steps they have taken to promote and facilitate participation. The amendment provides that public bodies will have to have regard to any guidance on this issued by Scottish ministers. And again, the national standards for community engagement, which we have committed to refreshing and renewing, will be prominent in this process. But we will also need to develop guidance on other aspects, including participatory budgeting, about which I have spoken many occasions and am a terrific enthusiast for, and how public bodies can ensure that the decisions they take on budgets and grants can be developed to encompass 
meaningful participation. Now, this is going to be a challenge for public bodies. Uh, local government, however, and other public authorities do increasingly use a, a wide range of community engagement activities to seek views on activities, plans and service delivery. And I know that there has been a tremendous interest in the Scottish Government's offer of training and support for the participatory budgeting exercises, with more than half of Scotland's councils taking up that offer and uh, some in the next year uh, to be allocated through participatory budgeting methods that will be potentially, if all come through, running into the millions. But the, the range and degree of participation from people and communities can vary very, very considerably. This new power will lead to greater consistency and improve the quality of that participation over time. It's not going to happen from day one, but it is going to happen. The Parliament will continue to have a role to play as we move forward with this agenda. And Amendment 1224 provides that the regulations, any regulations laid under this, will be subject to the affirmative procedure. I look forward to developing and implementing this, which is going to be, for me, a major strand of the community empowerment agenda. I hope that the committee will be keen to work with us, uh, and I move Amendment 1223. Um, Mr Rowley, please. Um, Kavinar, I'm, I'm happy to support the amendment. I think that if you look at participatory budgets, it's about having some sort of meaning to them that people can identify with. And some of the amendments, and hopefully we can have a discussion in the coming weeks as we move forward to stage three, but some of the amendments around lo locality planning actually, I think, complement this very idea. If you look at a local authority budget, I mean, Children's services, education will take up 50 odd percent of the budget. If you then take health and social care, you can be up to 70 odd percent. We participate in budgets. I think we, we, we talk about 1 percent. If 1 percent in a local authority budget, for example, was down at that level and, and there's a formula in place to get it down that level, more people will take part if they are able to identify their priorities and then do the budget to, 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 to finance their local priorities. The, the thing that often concerns me about the participatory budgets, and I know there are some good examples, but I have looked at some, and it's a bit like you go into to ASDA and, and when you come out you get a wee green token and there's, there's three pots and you stick it into it. It's got to be a, bit, a lot more than that. And I think by the, the amendments previously, and if we're able to work with that, this would then enhance that. And people would be able to, to I think, have... Um, not only the ability to set their local priorities, but with us, be able to finance some of them. And so I welcome it. Thank you. Um, uh, I would say bravo, Minister. I think a lot of folk out there will be applauding this. And certainly this uh, committee will continue uh, to scrutinise this as it moves forward. Would you uh, like to wind up, please, Minister? Yeah, just very briefly to reflect on a point that Mr Rowley just made. I'm aware of the, the supermarket... Uh, exit uh, form of, of deciding on charitable donations and it is noticeable that there are certain causes that will do better but that is not a participative process it doesn't bring people together have that discussion and have the cases put forward it's quite a shallow form of engagement and what we want to get past for public decision making is shallow forms of engagement to, to very much deeper uh, forms of participation he's also right to say that there is a great deal that is a statutory requirement. You know, we don't want a participatory budgeting process where a community comes together and decides that they don't want to spend any money on having a school anymore, because clearly there are some things that are obligations. But it's on those discretionary spends on what you prioritise for maintenance or expansion. That is the area really uh, where participatory budgeting offers real opportunities to ensure that things are targeted to local needs. John Wilson. Does the Minister not agree that in terms of participatory budgeting, that communities need to know in terms of the larger resources, you, know, you mentioned, uh, used the example of a school, that it would maybe be helpful if communities in the discussions with local authorities and other agencies were aware of the bigger spend items and how they impacted on those communities uh, and where the participatory budgeting element of the budgets could actually be better utilised to actually complement those services rather than totally ignoring the fact that many in communities don't understand or don't realise where the bulk of local government and other agencies' resources go into supporting the community and delivering services for those communities. 
Minister, please. I totally agree. People need to realise how the, the spend they would be deciding on relate to everything else. And ultimately, you, want, you would hope that that would result in everybody pulling in the same direction. And I, I just think that this offers a tremendous opportunity to re-empower people, to take that spirit of democratic renewal that is abroad in this country and give it some real teeth so that people can not just go along and be consulted on something, but actually participate in the decision-making directly. A, a completely different level of involvement. And I'm glad that the committee has been so enthusiastic. And uh, I, I move press. Thank you. The, the question is that Amendment 1223 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Can I call Amendment 1271 in the name of Cameron Buchanan and a group in its own? Mr Buchanan, to move and speak to your amendment, please. Uh, I, I absolutely agree that the rating authority should have the interests of persons liable to pay council tax set by the authority before reducing or emitting non-domestic rates. As it stands, however, this clause, I think, suggests that any loss of income due to non-domestic rate cuts would have to be offset from other income raised by the authority. What my men were seeking to do is to clarify that before reducing or remitting non-domestic rates, a rating authority should have regard to its own expenditure, income and financial sustainability. In other words, rating authorities could accommodate any change in income due to non-domestic rate cuts by reviewing either their expenditure or their income. Could you move, please? Moved. Thank you very much. Um, Minister? Uh, amendment 1271 would add to the test in the bill which requires that a council have regard to the interests of persons liable to pay council tax as well as wider statutory financial obligations that councils have. The amendment would make explicit that councils have to have regards to their income and expenditure when exercising the local rates relief power. I think that councils would do so as a matter of course, given the framework and statutory obligations they operate under, but I would be content to support the amendment to reinforce the point in this section of law. Thank you. Uh, Mr Buchanan, do you like, want to wind up and press or withdraw, please? I thank the Minister for agreeing and I would to press my amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1271 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1087 in the name of the Minister and a group in its own? Minister, to move and speak to the amendment, please. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee recommended that where there are powers for ministers to amend the lists of bodies subject to the provisions of the bill, those powers should be subject to affirmative rather than negative procedure. I agree that changes to the bodies included could make a significant change to the scope of the bill's powers, so I'm happy to make that change to the procedure to be used. 1087 provides that changes to the list of public service authorities in relation to participation requests um, and changes to the list of relevant authorities in relation to asset transfer requests will be subject to affirmative procedure. It also provides for affirmative procedure where the Scottish Minister specify a relevant authority as subject to local authority review of its decisions in the first instance rather than ministerial appeal. Min uh, members will remember that power was discussed last week as a measure to uh, assist the inclusion of alios in asset transfer. Uh, I move Amendment 1087 and ask members to support it. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Um, I support this amendment. I just invite the Minister to take away for further consideration and perhaps discussion with colleagues uh, that as a matter of good practice, uh, when governments amend lists by secondary legislation, they should consider publishing in the update the entire amended list. There are instances of where lists have been amended more than 20 times and it is all but impossible to work out what the list looks like as there is no central list of the lists uh, to which can be reference can be made. I don't ask for a commitment at this stage apart from that you'll take it away and consider it, Minister. I will, take it, I will take it away, I will consider it and if I am Still the Minister, when the First Amendment comes forward, <laughs> I will make sure to put it into practice as well. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1087 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1038 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1015 on day one on the 4th of March? Uh, Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1038 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Uh, that's the biggest skipping back ever, I think, in these regards for us anyway. Uh, can I call Amendment 1224 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1223. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1224 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1071 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1043 again on day one. Uh, Alec Rowley, to move or not move? No. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 1071 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 97 and 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1225 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, grouped with Amendments 1226, 1227 and 1228. Minister, to um, move Amendment 1225 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Well, just to stop other uh, antiquated acts feeling lonely with the convener's love of the 1892 Act, this will uh, deal with the 1911, 1939, 1948 and 1958 Acts that have various references to allotments. As you might imagine, we have to update uh, quite a few references in previous legislation as a result of the Bill. Uh, Schedule 4 sets out minor and consequential amendments to other legislation, and Amendment 1225 inserts into that schedule additional required consequential amendments which have been identified since the Bill was introduced. Schedule 5 sets out existing legislation to be repealed as a consequence of the provisions of the Bill, and Amendments 1226, 1227 and 1228 insert into Schedule 5 additional repeals required to existing legislation which have been identified since the Bill was introduced. Uh, I move Amendment 1225. Thank you. I see no hands. Minister, you waive your right to, uh, to wind up. Yeah. The question is that Amendment 1225 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendments 1039, 1040 and 1041, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated on day one. Uh, Minister, can I invite you to move amendments 1039 to 1041 on block? Moved on block. Thank you very much. Does anybody uh, object to a single question being put on these? Um, the question is that amendments 1039 to 1041 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, before I put the question on Schedule 4, I'd remind members that we are agreeing to Schedule 4 as amended by the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, as well as as amended by this committee today. The amendments agreed to by the Rural, Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee were amendments 38, 39, 40, 41, 88, 46, 47 and 57. The question is that Schedule 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call amendments uh, 1226, 1227, 1228 in the name of Aileen MacLeod, debated earlier today, and amendment 1042 in the name of Marco Biaggi, debated on day one. Um, Minister, can I ask you to move amendments 1226 to 1228 and amendment 1042 on block, please? Moved on block. Thank you. Does anybody object to a single question being put on these amendments? No. Uh, the question is that amendments 1226 to 1228 and 1042 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, again, before the before putting the question on Schedule 5, I'd remind members that we're agreeing to Schedule 5 as amended by the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, as well as amended by this committee today. Uh, the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee agreed to one amendment to Schedule 5. That was Amendment 42. Uh, the question is that Schedule 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that sections 99 and 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have no amendments to the long title to consider, but I would remind members that the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee did agree to one amendment to the long title, Amendment 43, and so we're agreeing to the long title as amended by that amendment. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that ends stage two consideration of the bill. 
Uh, and as amended, at Stage 2, print of the bill will be available from tomorrow morning. Stage 3 amendments may also be lodged from tomorrow, although we do not yet know when Stage 3 will be. Can I, can I thank everyone for their participation today? Um, I suspend and we move into private session, and I would appeal to those folks who are leaving to do so quickly, please.